good afternoon. Welcome to the 2023 Ashland Range Fly-In. Welcome to those who are viewing live and to those who will view this later. And welcome to members and friends of the Grange who have joined us today. <clears throat> For those friends, the Grange strengthens individuals, families, and communities through grassroots action, service, education, advocacy, and agriculture awareness. That's the mission statement of the Grange. And today's event embodies most of those points in our, in our mission. This is our 156th anniversary, our year of serving rural America. Legislative advocacy is one of our most important tasks on the national level. At the local level, we're all about community service, finding the needs in our communities, and filling them, and training our members to be good citizens, especially our youth and juniors. Here in the national office, we're blessed to have two excellent legislative staff members, Director Burton Eller and Assistant Sean O'Neill, to keep up with everything that's going on here in D.C. Um, now I'll turn the program over to Sean for the first brief presentation. Please, as you're watching today, keep your computers on mute. And if you have a question for a presenter, please type it in the chat at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for joining us. Hey, hello, everybody. Um, glad to see you all here on Zoom. We've got a lot of people joining us, which is good. Um, I'm just going to right now give a quick presentation to run through some congressional basics and background, um, some of which most of you will probably already know, but good to have a refresher before we jump into our more substantive speakers uh, later today. And after me, Burton will go over a bit of the schedule and more. Um, but Stephanie will put up a presentation for you all in just a moment. <laughs> I think everybody can see now. Jump All right, so just obvious, easy basics. These are things you should probably know for civics class, but wanna make sure we get them out of the way. Everybody's on the same page today before we hear from members of Congress and Senate later today. So background, easy stuff, House of Representatives, 435 members two-year terms, so a bit shorter than up in the Senate. Uh, things like tax bills, revenue bills have to originate in the House, so if you're getting taxed, it started there. Um, it has 20 standing committees, which are where everything works through, which we'll talk about a little bit later. You'll hear um, right after me and Burton are done uh, from Chairman D.T. Thompson of the House Agriculture Committee, one of the most important committees for the work the grain does here in Washington. Um, and then also it's a simple majority required for legislation. So just one more than 50% to get things done. Um, of course, the Senate, the second big part of the equation here in Washington, has 100 members, 100 senators. Uh, they serve six-year terms, so longer than the House, and can do maybe more long-term thinking. I'll just finish up that slide. They have 16 standing committees. Again, we'll hear from another fine chair woman later today, Debbie Stabenow, who is uh, Senator from Michigan and sent along a video for us to enjoy later today, and we'll hear from some of their staff as well. Um, and also, let's the filibuster, so they got to do a little bit more work to get things done over there, a little more compromise. Need about 60 votes usually to get most things done. So that's basics. Make sure everybody's on the same page. You know, you have a good understanding of uh, who the people are who are speaking to you later today, where they come from, what their incentives maybe look like. Uh, but most of that you can probably already know. So we can jump to the next slide here. Uh, to talk a little bit more about how Congress works, the making of the laws. And these are things that uh, Burton and I and Betsy and everyone here in D.C. Uh, works on the most, most of our time here is working in, in, in these systems. So the first is the committee system. Everything Congress does is not done and voted on by every member of Congress all the time. They divide up the work. That's division of labor, helps them get things done. They tried it in the beginning without committee, didn't really work so well. Um, that allows for things in agriculture to be focused on by folks 
who have expertise. The next point there in agriculture, folks who come from farming districts, farming backgrounds, rural districts, have that sort of input from their constituents. Um, folks who maybe have different expertise might work on an intelligence committee, foreign affairs or commerce, things like that. Um, again, we'll hear from two folks who are committee chairs later today, but we'll also hear about other issues beyond agriculture, healthcare, broadband, which are parts of other committee work and that Bert and I have to keep our eyes on. And it's worth understanding where things originate from in, in Congress to understand how these issues uh, move from you know, advocacy to law. Um, and the last thing that's important about committees is power. They allow members to have power over different areas uh, of the law, over different areas of interest to their constituents, to influence policy. A member who sits on the Agriculture Committee has a lot more power and influence over agriculture policy than somebody who does not, for example. So worth keeping in mind, again, when you hear people talk about issues and hear people talk about agriculture, do they sit on that committee? Do they have power and influence over that area of law? Um, the next piece for understanding how Congress works is omnibus bills. Uh, most of the time you think, you'd imagine, that Congress might just have one issue, something simple, and they pass a law, it goes along the way, you know, we're gonna change, you know, create a new crop insurance category for this crop. Okay, you know, that's one simple thing, put it all together in one short little bill, pass it through. Not so simple. Most things in Congress happen in omnibus bills. A whole bunch of different issues get glued together and put into one big giant package. <laughs> So that a lot of different people support it. Uh, a prime example, which we'll hear about today, is the Farm Bill. Uh, we'll hear from Democrats, Republicans, members of the House, members of the Senate today about the Farm Bill. That's how American agriculture policy is created every every five years. But it's also how things like nutrition policy to do with uh, supplemental nutrition nutrition assistance programs, SNAP, or um, things like conservation, or things like crop insurance, all get glued together in one big bundle so that it's able to be moved through Congress. Why? Well, because that's compromise. With 435 members representing all sorts of different districts, not every district cares about agriculture. Not every district has a lot of, in, you know, a specific crop type or even a lot of ag land in general in it. So they're not going to be supportive of big ag policies on their own. Same goes for different um, constituencies in different areas have different levels of interest in nutrition assistance programs or conservation programs or things like that. And so when you take all these issues and put them together, you can get members to vote on things. Now, what's that mean for advocacy? That means you have to be aware of where these bills are going and what vehicles, the farm bill, you can get your piece of legislation attached to or your interest area attached to so that you can move it along through the process. So again, I'll keep hitting the farm bill because it's easy and we're talking about it a lot today. Every five years, if you've got farm policy, that's when you gotta be on the ball and you gotta be moving stuff. Uh, we're working double time here to make sure our grain priorities get put in the farm bill. If you're interested in getting involved in that, it's good to understand how things get done and how you can get involved now to work on farm issues. Um, a couple other examples I put up there that are ongoing and somewhat in the past maybe is the debt limit, which has been a big conversation here in Washington. It's going to end up being resolved, we hope, um, through a big omnibus bill with all sorts of different policies and provisions attached to it. Um, annual appropriations, which is how the government is funded, are done in sort of a big omnibus ball of all sorts of different things and include all sorts of changes in them. And then a last one, which has already passed, for last Congress, is the infrastructure bill, which funded everything from bridges and rivers and dams to energy exploration to a huge grant priority, rural broadband. Again, we'll hear from speakers a bit more about what that looks like and means to, later today, but rural broadband money came through first an omnibus bill. That's, uh, the, that's the infrastructure bill. Um, so we can move on from, from that, but that's making laws, how Congress gets it done. Next thing to understand, okay, so that's Congress sort of as an institution, as it operates, um, you know, fundamentally, structurally, how things get done in an institutional manner. But Congress is also important to understand how individual members, how members of Congress, senators operate and exist in that, and understanding that is important for, you know, influencing or advocating or working with these members to achieve the goals of you, your community, your grains, the national grains here in Washington. So to understand that, let's let's look, let's look at how a congressional office functions. So these are the sort of the things that congressional offices do, and, and they're in sort of an order of importance listed there, um, at least from the perspective of the member of Congress. So the first is providing constituent services. Um, that's usually something that happens in the district. So in your hometown, in your local area, you'll probably have an office for your member of Congress, perhaps for your senator as well, where you can reach out to them and get their help with some sort of problem you have as a constituent. That's usually things like a problem with 
a federal agency, for example, if you're having difficulty receiving your veterans affairs benefits, or you're having trouble with, you know, the Bureau of Land Management has some land perhaps near a property that you own and you're having trouble with that. Or you're having trouble understanding the WOTUS rule, the Environmental Protection Agency, or any number of different things. You can reach out to your congressional offices in your district and they'll help you out with it, which is a good thing to know for yourself. But it's also an important part of how members of Congress are able to show they're out and about in the community, being helpful, they're doing things, they're getting in the paper, they're having, you know, a helpful, useful impact for folks back home. So that's a big priority for members of Congress. They have a whole office dedicated to it back in the district. Um, the second is communicate with constituents, which goes a little hand in hand with constituent services, but looks more like sending out a newsletter or maybe, um, you know, advertising events or writing op-eds or social media posting about what's going on in your community. That's a big part of how, again, they promote themselves. They make it clear that they care about you. They care about your issues, things like that, so that they can get reelected. Um, an important interest for any member of Congress. It's not, not to be totally cynical, but that's what you know, a lot of the, the game's about. Um, so worth keeping in mind, how are they communicating with folks back home in your specific district, um, in your state, in the case of your senator, and you know you can sign up for that. You can hear what they're doing, see what they're doing, and, and keep, keep in the know on what's going on, and that way you can be a better advocate. Um, third is meet with constituents. So that's things like, um, and it goes along with the host and attend events in the district, which is the next one, but that's like they'll have open office hours or maybe a town hall in the district. Maybe they'll go to your Grange Fair if you invite them, which you ought to do since a lot of them would love to come to your Grange Fairs if they just get an invitation or your state session or things like that. Um, and we'd be happy to help here in Washington. Um, and that's, you know, again, getting out in the community, promoting themselves, touring a local farm, whatever it may be, um, getting out and about and, and showing off in the district. A big part of what they do. Um, then all of that sort of those first four all come together and seek and create positive press. They spend a lot of time trying to make sure that local hometown papers, local news outlets, local social media, all that sort of stuff is talking about all the good things and wonderful ways they're providing constituent services, meeting with constituents and hosting events. They went to, you know, this 4th of July parade, this strange fair, whatever, um, things like that. So that's a big chunk of things that they do, um, all focused on looking good in the district, having a good time back home. The last thing they do a lot of time and spend time on is actual legislating. They have a small little team of here in Washington uh, over on Capitol Hill that Bert and I spend our time trying to convince to support our fine grain policies. And, you know, that if you're interested too, um, you can also reach out to the people and ask for our help with it. But that's sort of the structure of, of things a congressional office does. Um, we know that from working in Washington a long time. I know that from you can see that picture there of my desk when I was an intern back in the day over on the hill. And uh, it's, it's, it's tight quarters in there in the legislative space. But most House offices, you know, they'll have a staff, maybe 20 people all around and only four or five of them are working on legislation. So shows the relative importance there. Um, and that last little bullet point is just if you don't know who your members of Congress are or your senator is, then you can go to that link there, which will be. Um, and some of the materials we send out later as well, um, and learn and figure out who your representative is based on your zip code, things like that. So that's sort of, okay, we've talked about Congress as a system. Now Congress has individual offices and members. Uh, we can move to the next piece to talk about what does that mean for you? If you're here on this Zoom call, I hope that means that you're interested in the advocacy mission of National Grange or a long story tradition and history of it. Um, this is some of the strategy you can use now that you understand how maybe Congress works as a system and as its members to make that advocacy powerful. Um, the first point is local focus. Focus on things that are affecting your community. Um, talk about how it impacts you, yourself, your family, your neighbor, your grain, whatever it may be, because members of Congress, senators care most about issues that affect their local community. They affect people who vote for them. You know, to put it bluntly at the end of the day, if it's you know, you live in a state which doesn't have a whole lot of something, you know, whatever, and you're on the other side of the country, officer, you're not going to make as much of an impact, right? But if you're talking about, you know, my local community, this is how, say, changing the water of the United States rule or um, infrastructure spending or broadband expansion is going to affect my community, my neighborhood, my grange, whatever, you're going to get a lot more attention, local focus, right? Um, second piece is advocacy that requires effort. And we'll present some data on this in a second. But the more effort your advocacy takes, 
the more likely it is that a congressional office and a member of Congress is going to pay attention to you. So social media posting, as fun as it may be, or sending emails, or even just a quick phone call to yell at the congressional office, whatever it may be, doesn't get a whole lot of attention paid. Because it's easy, you know, that's just something you did because you were mad and you put it together a tweet or a Facebook post or an email or a phone call real quick, doesn't get a whole lot of attention. That's not something that takes a whole lot of effort. Things like hosting a member of Congress, going to a town hall, um, coordinated letter writing and phone calls, being, you know, on top of it all the time, things like that, that's going to be a lot more something that members of Congress pay attention to. Because they see, if you're putting all this effort into it and you're building momentum behind it, perhaps you and your grains are working together on it or something like that, it's something you care a whole lot more about and you're more likely to vote because of that. Um, and as well, it gets more attention in the community, which is, you know, likely to get other people to be paying attention to that issue and maybe voting this way or that way based on it, right? So advocacy that requires effort. That's the second sort of piece of strategy, right? So locally focused, advocacy that requires effort. And then these two next ones, concrete ask and singular ask, sort of go hand in hand. Um, concrete ask means ask for something that you can hold your member of Congress or your legislature, your state legislator accountable to. Don't just say support broadband. Don't just say be opposed to this rule, to this, you know, concept, something like that, right? Because it's too broad. It's easy for a member of Congress to sort of, you know, weasel around. It, right? Oh, of course I support broadband. That's right. Yeah, of course. That's easy. They can just say that. But if you go to them and you say, my community, I know about this neighborhood, this area, which does not have access to internet. And I want you, my state legislature at this point, because that's where the money is for broadband, to focus on getting broadband to that community, that's concrete. They, they either do or do not get broadband to that community. It's something you can hold them accountable to. It's something that you can keep asking about saying, hey, you know, the, you said you support getting broadband to this community. It hasn't happened yet. You know, what's the disconnect here, right? So that's concrete. Singular means that when you're advocating for something, don't just go and present your whole political belief, you know, diatribe, manifesto, whatever that may be. Because again, it's easy for them to sort of say, oh, you know, I agree with this and this that you said, sort of sneak around all these different parts. If you're going on a long diatribe, they're not really going to pay much attention to you. I know, again, from working in a congressional office that, you know, somebody would speak to me on the phone for an hour. And at the end of the day, they just get marked down for one issue that they talk the most about. But your whole lecture on, you know, your political history and beliefs and how whatever, whatever, doesn't get all the way there. So have something singular specific, concrete, that you can ask your member of Congress, your state legislature, your state government, your federal government, whatever, to focus on when you're advocating. So bring that, whether it's with your grain, with your personal self, bring that sort of singular ask and say, I want you to bring broadband to my community or something like that along those lines. Or I want you to support changing the WOTUS rule in this specific way. But don't run on and on, and on um, as I am a little bit here. But... <laughs> The last piece is persistence. Um, keep following up. Don't just do this all one, you know, the first four, if you hit all those, that's great. But if you just do it one time, now they can shrug it off. But if you're there every month, every week, every year, you invite your member of Congress to your grain tall, your grain fair, your whatever. Um, you're always calling and sending letters. Persistence is how you keep them accountable and keep them interested and engaged in what you're doing. So that, you know, can help make sure that Every year, year after year, you get you get that sort of attention and you can hold them accountable, hold them to. Um, so those are sort of the big strategy points. So we can jump to the next one here um, for just a little, I guess, evidence. This is some polling done a few years ago by our friends of the Rural Electric Cooperatives, which we've taken here to show that point about advocacy that requires effort. You see congressional offices. Um, this is how much they weigh different activities and things like that, um, constituent views and opinions. Things like attending events, personalized messages, interstate office hour, town hall, things like that require effort, get a whole lot more attention over on the hill than things that don't require effort. Like, um, I mean, you see my face there, it's a little out of date, but <laughs> YouTube, Twitter comments, Facebook, Senator's blog, those sort of things don't get much weight put on. So advocacy that requires effort is how you're going to get the attention of your legislators a whole lot more. Um, and then we'll jump here to... The last slide for me, before Burton can hop in and talk a little bit about our schedule today and what's going on, is tactics. So now you sort of, okay, you've got this understanding, that's how Congress works, as a system in its offices, here's maybe the strategic way I should approach advocacy, what are some of the specific things I can do about it? Here's what you can do, as specifically the grain empowers you to do a lot of these things, 
uh, better than you might otherwise be able to. So first is knowledge. I've talked a lot about different things, which hopefully has increased your knowledge of how this works today. But you should have knowledge of your specific member of Congress or state legislature officials' positions before you go to them. Don't just come shouting about different issues if you don't know what they already support or already work. They're working on something you like. Thank them for it. Uh, they hardly get any praise, so sometimes that praise can be a lot more valuable and impactful than otherwise. But um, and if they don't support it, you can you know ask why or interrogate that position a little bit more. Um, second is town halls, either hosting or attending. Um, almost every member of Congress will have town halls will announce, again, this is the knowledge part, through their social media, their newsletter, things like that, um, that you can learn about and go and attend with you, yourself, and maybe members of your community to ask about specific issues. Or grain being grain and us owning all sorts of fine properties all over the country, uh, Great just can host town halls and offer that ability to uh, your state legislatures, your state officials, your federal officials, whatever it may be. And I know Great News already do this and host town halls every year um, with members of Congress and have influence and advocacy opportunities in that way. Um, but something to keep in mind, and again, that's advocacy that requires effort. And that goes hand in hand with the next piece, which is hosting elected officials. It doesn't have to be just a town hall. I talked earlier about inviting them to your uh, annual Grange Fair, or maybe you have an 150th anniversary coming up. I know there's lots of those. Um, maybe you have an annual big dinner or something you host, whatever it may be at your Grange, invite them to attend. And uh, again, give yourself an opportunity to make your voice heard. Um, fourth, district office visits. Again, something that members will have a lot and announce ahead of time through the knowledge piece, subscribe to their newsletter or something. And you can go sign up and attend, maybe attend as a group from your Grange or as individuals or on behalf of your grant to talk about a specific issue that's affecting your community. Um, that goes hand in hand again with coordinated outreach. So, okay, maybe all this big heavy stuff isn't where you wanna get started. You haven't done advocacy as a grant before. Um, a good idea might be, okay, let's all take a grant meeting and write letters or emails or phone calls to our member of Congress about a specific issue that you care about. Um, and again, make them personalized and, and interesting and, um, advocacy that requires effort there. And then the last piece, and this is what I'll leave you with before I hand it off to Burton to talk about our schedule today and a little bit more of what you're gonna see after me, is work with the National Grange. Uh, we beg you, please, if you're doing any of these things, let us know um, so that we can do our part to work with the office here in Washington of a member of Congress, if you're hosting an official or something like that, to follow up on these issues and do maybe some of that persistence piece for you. Um, and then also, if you have questions about how you can get involved in this, how you can start doing this, uh, please reach out to Burton or I or anyone here on national staff and we can try to help you out. But please, please, please work with your national grade. Don't You don't have to go it alone. You don't have to try everything, reinvent the wheel, all of that. Uh, work with us. So that's, I guess, my little spiel. Um, before we start, hopefully I've warmed you up and gotten everybody on the same page advocacy-wise, but uh, I'll dish it to Burton now to talk a little bit about the more interesting people, members of Congress, sound like you're talking to you later. So, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Pretty good to see all that energy and enthusiasm on behalf of the National Grange here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Sean is known for around town for his enthusiasm and his persistency. He goes on persistence, but uh, he believes in that stuff. That's where he gets things done when he's down on the hill. My name is Burton Elder. I do the advocacy work here at the Grange, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the uh, fly-in this year. Uh, we've got uh, about 80 people registered, and uh, the podcast will go up on the uh, website so that folks can see it later on. And if you have questions or suggestions as we finish, uh, please uh, please let us know. Uh, as Betsy said, please keep your microphone turned off, and your questions in the chat box, uh, we'd be glad to address some of those. Uh, maybe we can't get to all of them. Today we're going to start with one of Grange's three legs to the milk stool. Uh, right today, Grange has basically three major issues it follows, and that is agriculture and food, health care, and telecommunications spell broadband, broadband, broadband. So uh, as you know, for two decades, Grange has been looking to get broadband to the uh, last mile of country road. That opportunity came, and uh, we're spending a lot of time following up on that. But to start from agriculture, uh, we're going to hear from the Senate Committee Chairwoman, Debbie Snavenow, 
And then uh, her professional staff member on the committee, um, Michaela Brody, will be here to uh, online to follow up on the issue she brings up and to answer some questions. Followed by Chairman Glenn G.T. Thompson, Chairman of the House Ag Committee. And follow up with his comments on the issue and answer questions is Josh Maxwell, special staff member on the House Agriculture Committee. Then we're going to move to health care. Um, and this is the biggest box for the Grange probably this year. If any one single issue, perhaps besides the Farm Bill, it will be health care. Um, we tell everybody that we never didn't think we'd be in the health care business in the Grange probably, but right now uh, we are there. Uh, this is because of the rural health issues. Uh, we're a little older, we're a little sicker, we're a little less insured, and we're a lot longer from health care and hospitals and specialists than anybody else. So it's, it's a big challenge for us. Um, so Janet Mikulski, uh, the founder and CEO of the Health Council, so we'll be here for that portion. Then we jump into telecommunications. Uh, Jenna Alsega from the U.S. Telecom, which is the umbrella industry organization for the telecommunications industry. We'll be here to talk about how we're getting along on implementing that broadband. Uh, what some of the companies are doing and what how her company monitor or how her association uh, monitors that with the member companies. And I've asked her to give you a little update on those illegal robocalls we love so much that bug us um, that they are taking the lead in uh, in getting to the bottom of some of that and it has cut them. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been 100 percent effective, and I'm not sure they ever find the last robocall. But I've asked her to update folks what the U.S. Telecom is doing on illegal robocalls. Um, and then uh, we have Laura Leveret from the USDA. Um, U.S. Telecom is going to do a 50,000 foot view of uh, where we are on broadband. And Laura is going to dig real deep because it's her job to implement the USDA programs uh, for real broadband in America. And that's very important. And uh, last, we'll give you a little update about a great broadband project we're just beginning. And uh, that'll finish us for the day. Um, thank you for joining us. And at this time, I'll just move right ahead and introduce our leadoff speaker, Senator David Stabenow. Mr. Stabenow became history in 2000, when she became the first woman from Michigan to be elected to the U.S. Senate. She's known for her ability there to build coalition, get things done for Michigan and done for our nation. As chairwoman of the Senate Ag Committee, she, she is chair of the Senate Ag Committee. She's also a senior member of the Senate Finance Committee, Budget Committee, and a member of the Environment and Public Works Committee. That means she has a lot of power and a lot of major issues today from environment to taxes and trade to food and agriculture. That's a big but. Um, she was born in Glenwood, Michigan, and raised in Clare, where she graduated and taught for high school class at Clare High School. She then received her bachelor's and master's degree from Michigan State University. She worked with youth in the public schools before running for public office. Senator Stabenow now served 12 years in the Michigan House of Representatives, four years in the state Senate, and then she was elected to. Uh, the 8th District, Congressional District of, of Michigan, before being elected to the Senate. She's a national leader in food and agriculture, as we, we all know, and she's a force for Michigan agriculture. Ms. Stabenow now has a full section in the Farm Bill that is her section called Specialty Crops several years ago. I remember that well. Agriculture is Michigan's second largest job source, so it is important. The chairwoman of the Senate Agriculture Committee, Ms. Davenow, authored the 2014 Farm Bill. That's, that, that's it. She built that, all that success in co-authoring the 2018 Farm Bill, which passed on a strong bipartisan vote of 87-13, the most Senate votes ever for a Farm Bill. She's a magician at heart. She sang for her church and her family and the community, and her home is in Lansing, Michigan. I give you Senator Stephanie. Hello, Grangers. 
thank you for the opportunity to join you today. You know, rural communities like my hometown of Clare in Northern Michigan are part of the fabric of our wonderful nation. And we have to continue to invest in these communities so they can thrive now and well into the future. Last Congress, I was proud to champion investments in the bipartisan infrastructure law. We're building safer roads and bridges, investing in new rural water projects, and working to ensure that all Americans have access to broadband internet. High-speed internet is not a frill, and we need to make sure all of our small towns, rural communities have the access they need. Think of the difference this will make for small businesses. Students doing their homework, seniors who need to see a doctor, and anyone who wants to connect with friends and family. It will bring all of our communities closer together. Our rural communities are also on the front lines of the climate crisis, which is something you see firsthand every day. We all see it now firsthand every day with the volatility and the weather. Last year, we secured a historic investment of nearly $40 billion to tackle this crisis, to lower costs, particularly in rural communities for energy use, and create good paying jobs in small towns across Michigan and America. This Congress, I'm focused on passing a bipartisan farm bill, as you know, that will help keep our rural communities resilient and thriving. My partner on the committee, ranking member John Bozeman and I have held hearings on every title of the farm bill and we're actively engaging with everyone impacted all across the country. I'm confident that by working together, we can pass another bipartisan farm bill that the president will sign into law. But challenges remain in the months ahead. We must hold together the broad coalition that led to historic bipartisan support for the 2018 Farm Bill. This will be essential in passing a bill that builds resilient small towns and rural communities, reflects the diversity of American agriculture, and supports the vital nutrition programs that millions of Americans rely on. We need your voices, Grangers, as usual. The voices of farm families and rural communities. We've accomplished so much together and I'm proud to be your partner. Thank you, Senator Tabernow. The 2018 Farm Bill was a major bipartisan effort on the Senate Ag Committee and in the Senate. Uh, now retired Senator Pat Roberts from Kansas was the ranking member with Mrs. Cavanaugh in 2018. And it was a shining example of what can be done in a bipartisan way. The focus is on the mission and the outcome and not on the politics and the personal issues. Uh, we, we're looking forward to that again this year with Senator Cavanaugh and with Senator Bozeman. Um, it's not going to be an easy bill to craft, but it, it, it will get done. And with those two leaders, it will get done in a bipartisan manner. We've asked Makeda Bowling to come and uh, follow up with the senator, which she's graciously agreed to do. Um, we want to dive deeper into the issues and uh, of the farm bill and the other issues facing the uh, Senate Agriculture Committee on Nutrition and forestry uh, this year, and uh, then field some questions at the end. Uh, we have a hard stop for uh, Michaela to get her out of here by two o'clock, and uh, we will do that without any problem. But I first need to introduce you to Michaela. She currently serves as professional staff uh, member for Chairman Chairman Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow on the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. In this role, Michaela is the committee's chief advisor on rural development and energy issues. She previously served Congresswoman Angie Craig from Minnesota as her senior legislative assistant, covering issues related to the House Agriculture Committee and the House Committee on Energy. Before that time, 
she was with, uh, I'm sorry, before her time with Senator Craig, with, with Representative Craig Michaela led the agriculture portfolio for former Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri. Michaela holds a bachelor's degree in public policy and management from the Ohio State University. <laughs> Michaela grew up on a family farm in St. Paris, Ohio. Of course, currently lives here in Washington, D.C. And Michaela, to kick this off, um, take as much time as you need. Uh, tell us where we are uh, in the process of the farm bill, the, all the input and, and all the things that are going into it. And then uh, can you tell us about when you think you might get started and some of the uh, hurdles you have to cross uh, as you get into the farm bill and uh, any, anything else you can share. And, and the farm bill is not the only issue uh, with uh, the Senate Aid Committee. Uh, you have... Uh, one of the U.S. issues that uh, you can't do anything about right now, but it's certainly a big issue. Uh, you have a lot of other issues that uh, are pending once the farm bill gets out of the way. And uh, kind of tell us what's going on at the, uh, at the uh, Senate Bank Committee uh, for the next six to 12 months. Makeda, love you. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for the opportunity to join. Um, Happy to be joining you virtually. Thank you for your flexibility, Burton, um, as things are still very busy up here on Capitol Hill, as you all know. Um, so building on the remarks from Chairwoman Stabenow, you heard her um, explain that we are about to dive headfirst into a farm bill. And uh, I would argue that we're already halfway in it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Senate farm bill process and sort of where we are in that process, um, ways for you to engage in the farm bill process, um, as well as maybe talk uh, a little bit about some of the recent events in the Ag Committee um, and, and some things that, that we're working on on the implementation side. So, uh, first of all, you know, the Senate Agriculture Committee started the Farm Bill process over here last summer. We began with a field hearing in the chairwoman's home state of Michigan and then uh, proceeded to a hearing in ranking member Bozeman's home state of Arkansas and got the opportunity to hear from folks on the ground in their respective states about what was really critical for them, um, again, as, as we move toward this next Farm Bill. We then proceeded to have a slate of hearings, uh, hearing from folks in the administration and stakeholders as well about every title of the Farm Bill. So at this point, um, the Senate Agriculture Committee has held a number of different hearings. Um, back in November, we held our, our first of these Farm Bill title hearings specifically focused on rural development and energy. Um, in that rural development hearing, uh, we heard from Undersecretary Torres Small, who's currently leading the rural broadband uh, deployment efforts at USDA's Rural Utility Service, and uh, also heard from a number of stakeholders with interest in everything from rural electric cooperatives to rural health care, um, and really anything that just impacts rural quality of life and any way that we can continue to, to advance and improve rural quality of life through the Farm Bill. Um, in addition to these hearings here in D.C., we've had an aggressive uh, member feedback process where senators have been able to share priorities from their home states that are currently under consideration by the chairwoman and the ranking member. Um, but in addition to giving senators the opportunity to share their priorities, we also have a portal on our website where folks from the public, uh, like yourselves and other members of the Grange, can submit their priorities and what they would like to see reflected in the next Farm Bill. And I'd certainly encourage all of you to do that. Um, so our web address is agriculture.senate.gov. And we'd certainly welcome you to fill out our, uh, our form there on that website with any comments you'd like to have ahead of the Farm Bill. Again, that's agriculture.senate.gov. Um, to talk a little bit about rural development and energy, which are, are my primary roles here on the committee, when we talk about rural development, we're talking again about everything that touches uh, the USDA's uh, rural development mission area, right? So the Rural Business Cooperative Service, the Rural Utility Service, and the Rural Housing Service. Many of these programs are holdovers from the New Deal, thinking back to you know, the Rural Electrification Act of 1936, uh, bringing electric to uh, most of America. We're seeing the same kind of efforts under underway here um, when we talk about broadband. So um, just last year in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we had a, a record investment in high-speed internet across the federal government, about $64 billion in total, $2 billion of which was directed to USDA. Uh, to deal specifically with rural, uh, rural broadband access, um, in addition to a lot of other funds at NTIA and FCC that will also be handed to states. 
uh, also to pursue their rural broadband access um, initiatives and efforts. Uh, the chairwoman obviously strongly supports USDA being at the table when it comes to broadband development and not just broadband development for the sake of it, right? But broadband uh, networks that are dependable, that are reliable, and that provide best in class service for rural residents. Uh, we never wanna be in a situation where we are accepting mediocre speeds or service um, just because of where folks choose to raise their family. And, and so we certainly welcome and encourage um, continued support of the Grange of ensuring quality high-speed internet to rural America. Uh, some of those awards in the bipartisan infrastructure law at USDA have been made already, and some are still in progress. Um, so, you know, for folks who are working with local community leaders on access to broadband, there's still plenty of time, and you're going to hear later today, I saw on the schedule, um, from some of the experts at USDA Rural Development that are really leading the charge um, on finding where those awards can be, can be impactful um, for rural communities. In addition to broadband, I wanted to talk a bit um, as well about access to new and better markets for our farmers. Uh, this was a, an issue that we really saw come to, to a head um, in the pandemic. I think a lot of folks would say that these are tensions and issues that we're just building, but with supply chain challenges in meat processing, fruit and vegetable processing, we really saw these bottlenecks develop. Um, Senator Stabenow championed in the American Rescue Plan funding for local processors of meat and poultry and produce uh, to support rural small businesses, but also to give farmers a more direct line between themselves and consumers to increase the share of that food dollar that's going to, to farmers. And we want to continue to try to build on that work in the Farm Bill. And then finally, I'll just add that um, we certainly understand and want to try to find ways to address the ability for rural communities to access federal programs. It's all well and good for folks in Washington to say, we have all of these programs available, just apply here, right? And it's really not that simple. Um, the reality is that our urban counterparts um, have a lot of you know, additional funding at their disposable disposal for things like hiring grant writers or doing development and pre-development planning, the kind of capacity and assistance that us in rural communities are expected to pull together for ourselves. So um, one thing that we have continued to work with the Biden administration on and their pilot of the Rural Partners Network and other uh, rural development activities surrounding ease of access to programs um, for, for rural communities um, you know, we, we really want to continue to build on that and the farm bill and find uh, ways that we can try to give some flexible funding to rural communities to um, do that kind of economic development activity that you all want to do, right? Um, this doesn't need to be a, a federally led charge, but instead just giving rural communities and rural community leaders like yourselves the resources and the tools to do the successful, uh, you know, infrastructure needs that you all have. Uh, healthcare needs that you all have and getting out of the way, quite frankly, right? Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on is rural healthcare and really just the rural care economy, as I know that's a priority for the Grange as well. And I do think there are some opportunities in the Farm Bill um, where we can continue to see a lot of improvements in this area. One of the key programs during the pandemic, but also um, that we solidified in the 2018 Farm Bill is USDA's um, distance learning and telemedicine program, which um, allows small local uh, healthcare providers to connect to larger networks. So, you know, things like a smaller doctor's office being able to have telemedicine capabilities to a larger regional hospital, um, as well as, you know, um, connecting folks who are dealing with substance use disorder and, and other issues um, to, the, to the care that they need. And uh, we see the Farm Bill as an opportunity to continue to build on that program and continue to support that program and, and um, would certainly welcome any engagement from you all on that. I would also say another Farm Bill program that we've seen be incredibly successful in the healthcare space is the um, USDA Community Facilities Program. And community facilities, as many of, as, of you know, uh, are flexible dollars that communities can spend to build essential community infrastructure, everything from firehouses and emergency response, um, all, you know, up to nursing homes and hospitals and child care centers. Again, really those critical rural quality of life um, uh, pieces of infrastructure that our, our rural communities might need some help uh, getting access to. So as again, as we look to the Farm Bill, we'll certainly be, be looking there um, and opportunities we can continue to engage on rural health care. I'd also add the importance of rural child care. Um, and, and, you know, I can't you know, say enough how much I know I share this feeling, and many of you also do too, 
um, at ways that we can continue to keep young people wanting to live in our rural communities, right? And and trying to, you know, have young folks see themselves being able to live in in rural America and have access to the the kinds of infrastructure around them that they want to have a family, right? Um, whether that be affordable and reliable childcare, the ability to work remotely through high speed internet, right? All of these are, are key pieces of keeping rural America vibrant and continuing to build on the things about it that we all love so much that we've dedicated our lives and professional careers um, to, to protecting and preserving that way of life. And we certainly want to use the Farm Bill in any way that we can to, to continue that. Um, and, you know, lastly, I, I want to, you know, drive home the point that the Farm Bill is a bipartisan process. Um, and Senator Stabenow alluded to that a lot. Um, when we started this process, the senator had really one directive for us as staff, which was that we want to beat the record of last year, uh, last Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill's record vote of 87 to 13. And uh, we only do that by continuing to have broad bipartisan support for the cornerstone things of the Farm Bill, right? Protecting the farm safety net and preserving the farm safety net. Uh, protecting the family safety net that nutrition programs provide, and also, you know, continuing support for things like conservation and research at our land grant universities. And, you know, again, these rural development issues that I mentioned, like rural broadband. So it really takes that full um, Farm Bill coalition to get us across the line. And we are certainly making progress in that direction. The Farm Bill um, is coming up for reauthorization and um, we sort of have this uh, deadline of September 30th for that de that deadline to for Congress to take action um, to reauthorize a number of farm bill programs. And so until then we will be up here very hastily working away uh, to make sure that we're, we're taking in all necessary feedback from stakeholders like the Grange and others um, to deliver a meaningful product for rural America. So thank you all so much for the time um, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. Um, Bert and I apologize. I think I might have to hop around 155. So I have about six minutes uh, for questions, but happy, happy to take those. A real task, Master Michaela. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, that was very comprehensive. In fact, it makes my head swim with everything you've got to get your arms around the next few months. Uh, did I hear you say that there was some money in the IRA for... Uh, uh, some help on grant funding and for some of the rural projects. Um, is there is there any way that our rural communities can get into the grant process easier than we have in the past? That's we hear from grazers all the time that we'd love to get into that, but yeah. we can't do it on our own, and we don't know who to go to for help. And what's that going to cost? Right. So um, during the negotiations of the Build Back Better and Inflation Reduction Act packages that President Biden put together, uh, one of the first things the president put forward was a rural partnership yeah. program, essentially, you know, flexible funds for rural communities to do this kind of grant work. Um, and frankly, just planning work, right? Finding out the assets in your town that you have that you want to build on and, and trying to find folks to, to work around those things. Um, uh, unfortunately, that program fell out during a lot of the negotiations up here on the hill as the, the, the bill started to, to whittle down. And folks um, up here on the hill um, have expressed some desire to try to uh, reinvigorate that effort, a very similar effort around rural um, capacity um, in, in a farm bill context. So we did see a small pilot from the administration called the Rural Partners Network and would certainly encourage you all to utilize rural.gov. Uh, which the administration has put together uh, to try and sort of consolidate all of these rural programs for folks across federal agencies. And again, we'll be looking to how to build on that in the Farm Bill. That's a real step forward. I know that uh, it's been a real challenge. Uh, we've been aware of so many of these programs that are available, but connecting them down to the grassroots and getting boots on the ground and get them implemented has been a real challenge uh, for uh, rural development. Absolutely. Uh, question um, as you develop uh, the farm bill and we know there's a demand for uh, a, a section to expand disaster disaster aid and we've had a lot of natural disasters uh, shockingly uh, in the last year or two and um, we have a member that uh, wants to know maybe what we might do in the farm bill for increased disaster aid certainly so um, a couple different angles here you know the first being that we know that um, an existing strong farm safety net helps with a lot of those issues, right? <laughs> Having a strong crop insurance program, which Chairwoman Stabenow has, has long advocated for, um, is sort of that first step. 
Um, we also, you know, know that a lot of the, you know, recent disasters um, have resulted in loss, you know, both to farmers, but also to rural communities. And I think one of the, you know, key pieces, I won't speak too much to um, the commodities and livestock side, not my expertise, um, but uh, from a rural development perspective, um, being able to find ways that rural development can be flexible um, and available when when natural disasters happen in rural areas is really key, right? Um, as Grangers, you all know that. Oh, like, thank you for a few comments. Hello, I'm Congressman oh, Jinky Thompson. Sorry. Oh, oh. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Okay. I, I thought Chairman Thompson was in the room and I thought, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I can run. <laughs> Just trying to gear oh, it give up. him the floor. He's certainly more important. Uh, uh, so you know, I I um I I certainly uh you know uh, understand um the the desire to try to have some more flexibility. And one of the key ways we do that is utilizing the USDA staff that are on the ground right now, and also encouraging young people to take up rural development as a meaningful career. Right. Um, you know, having USDA staff on the ground who are flexible and able to um uh you know coordinate federal efforts on the ground be it with fema or other disaster agencies um is critical but you know finally i think this drives home the need for climate smart agriculture and clean energy and, and trying to address the climate crisis uh, we know that natural disasters are tied to changing climate and Chairwoman Stabenow has been a strong advocate for voluntary incentive-based conservation programs on agricultural land, um, but also finding ways that we can continue to combat the climate crisis um, to, to get our hands around what is going to end up becoming a really costly problem. Very good, we've got you for like 90 seconds more. One final question or, or comment. Um, the grades continues to hear from members who are basically small farmers, or entering farmers or wannabe farmers. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about how to get these folks involved. And I don't, I don't think Grange members are asking for some big federal program to lay out huge sums of money to get small people involved in small farms. But is there room in the farm bill to discuss uh, the, fall, the uh, small farmer and what they might need and how important they might be to American food supply? Sure. Well, we couldn't agree more that, you know, protecting the small family farm uh, is really critical to just the fabric of our country, right? When we think about rural America, that that's the picture that we have. And I think, um, you know, as we sort of look and look to the farm bill, there are a couple of different ways that um, we we find we're able to try and tackle this issue. One is access to credit um, and, you know, access to meaningful credit for, for ag producers. We certainly, um, you know, have ways of, of doing that in the credit title. We also have a lot of young and beginning farmer and rancher programs. Um, and again, some other good partnerships with the farm credit system. Um, it, but, you know, for smaller farmers, I think one of the key pieces that we have really leaned in on is this diversification of marketing and getting products to market, right? Um, not necessarily just that you yourself as the producer, you know, also are going to you know, milk cows and then make ice cream on the side and sell it yourself, but that you have some other options of, you know, who you're selling that product to. You have some other local processors who want to start a small business themselves. Um, you know, working with those local ag products can be really meaningful for a small town's economy, but also, you know, gives, gives farmers some ability to not be dependent on just one large company who's buying their product, right? And so um, that's something we'll, we'll also be continuing to look um, at engaging on in the farm bill. McKenna, we want to thank you. This has been fantastic. And uh, you've done a powerful overview in this short amount of time. And we look forward to working with you and the uh, chairwoman and the members of the committee as we get through this process. And please don't hesitate to call on us. We can give you some feedback or some help or whatever we may do. Thank you for your time and, and uh, appreciate your, your effort for us. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your visit. Okay, we are now going to call on Chairman Thompson. Um, that, he's a very vivacious guy. But it, wouldn't, it, it wouldn't have surprised McKenna for him to bust in the room there on the Senate side. He, he's, uh, he's just like one of the guys and gals. Longtime resident of Howard, Pennsylvania, Congressman Glenn Thompson, known as his, as to his friends as GT, represents the Pennsylvania's 15th district in the House of Representatives. And that's the largest geographical district in Pennsylvania. 
and it has a lot of Grange members. So GT is very familiar with the Grange membership in his district. GT spent 28 years as a therapist, rehabilitation services manager, and a licensed nursing home administrator. It sounds like he's well qualified to work in Washington. He is an avid scout supporter. He's an Eagle Scout and a 30 plus year veteran of the Wanata Valley Scout Council. He served as the Scoutmaster Council Executive Board member and just about everything else that you can serve in the Scouts. GT received the National Distinguished Eagle Scout Award in 2012, and he's very proud of that. That's, that's a very high honor. He's the chairman of the House Ag Committee. He serves on the House Committee on Education and Workforce, and he's serving his fifth term as co-chairman of the Bipartisan Congressional Career and Technical Education Caucus. And that's another issue that he's lobbied for in Pennsylvania and done a lot of uh, support for in Pennsylvania is the uh, technical uh, training of our young people. He's a member of the Education and Labor Committee, which is another major committee for the greatest priority. And we appreciate that. GT is a proud graduate of Penn State and Temple Universities. He earned a BS and a Master of Education, respectively, at those universities. He and his wife, Penny Amarin Thompson, have three sons, and they re reside in Howard, Pennsylvania. Chairman G.G. Thompson. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to provide a few comments. For those who don't know me, I'm Congressman G.T. Thompson, proud representative of Pennsylvania's 15th District and chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture. As many of you know, I we have a farm bill that expires in September. Every chairman wants a farm bill that is bipartisan and on time. And I've always prided myself on my willingness to reach across the aisle. In order to write a meaningful farm bill that meets the needs of the entire agriculture value chain, we must first conduct a thorough audit of what's working, what's not, and what needs fine tuning. Rest assured, through a rigorous hearing schedule, farm bill listening sessions, and necessary oversight initiatives, we will continue working as efficiently as possible to provide producers and stakeholders with the certainty of a five-year reauthorization. One question I'm asked almost daily is, what are my priorities? Well, quite frankly, it's simple. Ask a farmer, ask a rancher, ask a forester, ask a consumer, because their needs should be our priorities. We must also consider the needs of rural communities as a whole. Accessible to reliable high-speed internet service is critical as it provides individuals the opportunity to expand businesses, learn new skills, receive healthcare, and even participate in daily activities. Connectivity struggles in rural communities existed long before the pandemic and Americans without high-speed internet access are being left behind. By supporting rural broadband programs, not only can we provide reliable connectivity for farm families, we can also bolster the use of technology in agriculture to help producers be even more efficient. Another way to support not just farm families, but folks nationwide who have fallen on hard times is through nutrition programs. Farm Bill nutrition programs embody the spirit of helping neighbors in need. We recognize the nutrition title both occupies a significant portion of the Farm Bill baseline and invokes a strong emotions on both sides of the aisle. However, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, can contribute to improving our nation's financial outlook by providing pathways to employment and promoting improved health and well-being. SNAP must be innovative and flexible, empower recipients through employment and education, emphasize health and nutrition education, and restore program integrity. Getting a farm bill across the finish line is a tall task. But as we've seen time and time again, each farm bill cycle brings its own unique challenges, but ultimately they get done. A successful reauthorization will require a lot of work from members and stakeholders, including all of you. I wanna thank you all again for the work that you do and for giving me the opportunity to provide a few comments. God bless. We'll uh, move to the uh, House Ag Committee now and the priorities and the challenges and the schedule for the House Agriculture Committee.
Josh Maxwell is on, and he serves as policy director at the House Committee on Agriculture for Chairman G.T. Thompson. Previously, John, uh, Josh served at the Committee of Senior Professional Staff for Conway of Texas, who was the prior chairman, and was lead policy advisor for the Conservation, Forestry Credit, and Energy Title here in the 2018 Farm Bill. That makes him very qualified to work in this year's Farm Bill. Josh has served several roles at the committee for Congressman Frank Lucas, who was chairman prior to uh, McCarway, during the 14 Farm Bill, and for Congressman Bob Goodlatte during the 2008 Farm Bill. So that's a lot of Farm Bill experience under your belt. Josh began with Capitol Hill as a Texas A&M University intern for Chairman Larry Combest with the House Ag Committee during the 2002 Farm Bill Conference. He began his professional career in 2003 for Representative Joe Barton of Texas before returning to the House Agriculture Committee. And we know he's had a lot of experience and we're looking forward to uh, having you, Josh, uh, tell us where you are on the Farm Bill, uh, what some of your priorities are, uh, what it takes to, to do a Farm Bill, and um, some of the challenges you know you're going to face before you get there to the end. And then uh, there's a lot more issues uh, on the uh, on the agenda for the House Ag Committee. So uh, we'd uh, love to so take a minute and uh, tell us about some of those issues you're going to be facing uh, between Farm Bill debates and after the Farm Bill is over. At the end, we'll uh, certainly have a few questions from our audience. Uh, and take as much time as you need, uh, and Josh. Welcome, and uh, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for the invitation to speak with you. Um, sorry I wasn't on to listen to my boss, uh, Chairman Thompson, speak. We had some uh, uh, technical difficulties, but we got those ironed out. So uh, it's definitely great uh, to, to be with you all. Um, again, my name is Josh Maxwell. I'm policy director, as you heard. Um, I have been around for a bit. This will be my fifth uh, farm bill uh, to serve under uh, Chairman Thompson, and I'm very excited. I've had a uh, uh, a long career working with Mr. Thompson from his time uh, first joining uh, when he first joined the Ag Committee as a member, but also when he served as the subcommittee chair uh, for conservation, energy, and forestry. And that's how we really got to know each other. Um, and, and he asked me to join uh, him in his chairmanship to stay on, knowing that issues under conservation, energy, forestry, and climate would be a, a big part of the debate, not only for Ag policy in general, but but going into the farm bill. So, as many of you are probably aware, the the farm bill is going to expire at the end of September of this year, and uh, the House Committee is is working very diligently uh, to prepare for its reauthorization. Um, I, I think one thing I would like to note is that while it does ex it expire on September thirtieth. Um, the committee in Congress does have a little bit of runway uh, beyond that to get a reauthorization done. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, number one, crop insurance is permanent. Uh, the SNAP program is permanent. Um, the IRA funds, the IRA funds that were passed in last Congress, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, extended the conservation programs. Uh, and the funding for those programs to 2031 and some of the energy programs. And so the only part of the farm bill that receives mandatory funding um, on a year to year basis uh, would be the Title I safety net commodity programs. And those programs um, don't necessarily kick in until crop year. And so the funding for that is not needed until next year. So in reality, um, Congress has a little bit, probably a drop dead date would be uh, New Year's Eve of this year to, for the need to get an ex, uh, a farm bill done without an extension. So I think that gives the, the House and Senate plenty of time uh, to continue the information gathering process, which is happening right now. Uh, you probably heard from Mr. Thompson. He's been traveling around the country, gaining feedback uh, from producers. Uh, we're having hearings here in Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, right now, as we're speaking uh, in the main hearing room, there is a commodity uh, subcommittee hearing going on, gathering input from producers on um, farm bill requests. 
Uh, and then you'll you'll see a time here where the chairman is going to reach out to, to every individual member of the House of Representatives and ask for their input. And what do they see as their priorities for their constituents uh, in a farm bill? Um, then he's going to work closely uh, with his members of the committee, uh, move a bill, uh, hopefully through the committee uh, late summer, uh, and then on to the House floor um, right after that. And then uh, move into the process where both committees, um, uh, both the House and Senate uh, committees uh, will work uh, in a conference uh, to iron out the differences. The exciting thing about conference this, this go around is that both the House and Senate trade off on who chairs that conference. So who kind of manages the and, and controls uh, how that conference proceeds. And so this time uh, it is the House's turn to conference a, uh, uh, the farm bill. And so if a conference is done while uh, Mr. Thompson is chairman, uh, then he will also chair that conference. Um, and so it's a huge responsibility and an honor and a, and a great way uh, to leave his mark uh, on shepherding a, a farm bill through. Now, I think many of y'all are aware of the challenges that arise when whenever you try and get a farm bill done, they're never um, um, as easy as, as people like to remember. Um, but um, I think Mr. Thompson is the right person uh, to lead this process. Uh, and he's here at a right time uh, where uh, in our Republican leadership, we have a speaker that is very engaged uh, and excited about the farm bill process. If Speaker McCarthy were in front of him, uh, he'd be uh, out front telling you he's gonna be the first modern day speaker to vote for a farm bill before he was in that leadership position. So he's been supporting farm bills before he had to. And he's looking to engage and support a farm bill uh, right now. And he's already participated in um, some of the uh, listening sessions that, that the committee's held. Um, and that goes a long way and is helpful um, in helping when, when the speaker has your back in shepherding a, a bill uh, through the House process. Um, you know, there's going to be many priorities uh, through this bill. But I think for Mr. Thompson, the number one priority is making sure it works for farmers and ranchers. Um, when you look at the safety net, um, we know that that currently the 2018 Farm Bill um, has had gaps in providing certainty to producers. Um, and we know that because um, uh, nearly $100 billion of ad hoc disaster uh, assistance has had to be authorized uh, or spent by Congress or administration over the last five years uh, to, to meet the disparities that, that have been occurring um, for the safety net. And that's not any way to do business. We want a farm bill that provides certainty, that reduces the need for ad hoc assistance. And when you reduce that need for ad hoc assistance, um, you can get um, those dollars to, to producers more quickly, and you can do it in a way uh, that is responsible to the taxpayer. And so those are two, two important goals uh, going forward is, is um uh, how, how can we be a fiscally responsible farm bill, but also one uh, that meets the needs of producers? And, and those are one of the things we'll be engaging. Uh, additionally, Mr. Thompson, um, based on his experience, is very supportive of the conservation forestry programs and energy programs. And are those programs uh, working uh, and streamlined to get assistance and, and uh, help to producers on the ground? So. A lot of work to do over the next uh, uh, few months, um, but I know he's looking forward to getting it done. And um, uh, I think beyond that, I, I'd, I'd really like to engage you all and find out what questions do you have and uh, and and what thoughts would, would you like me to, to touch on? So I, I'd like to turn it over to the audience if that's all right. Thank you, John. Um, maybe for those of us who don't have a lot of background in the farm bill, um, and I'm, I'm speaking tongue in cheek because a lot of people in this town have a lot of experience in the farm bill, but it's a, it's a big, big piece of legislation. Uh, can you maybe just quickly describe the, tw the 12 titles of the farm bill and more via 13th? And, and uh, you know, what are some new things that may be covering this year in the farm bill? Yeah, that's a great. Uh, question. That's a great question. Um, so 
I like when I like to talk about um, the jurisdiction of the Ag Committee and the Farm Bill. I always like to say it's more than sows, cows, and plows. Um, there's a lot that uh, goes into the bill. So number one, um, the the ten year spending baseline uh, of the Farm Bill is what the Congressional Budget Office uh, says the bill will cost. This will probably be the most expensive Farm Bill uh, over ten years. Uh, CBO projects that it will cost uh, just shy of $1.5 uh, trillion over that, that 10, 10 years. Now, about $1.1 or $1.2 trillion of that will be the nutrition programs or the SNAP programs, if you're familiar with, um, with that program. Uh, and then about $300 billion will be the farm part of the farm bill. So there is a huge discrepancy on the amount of money that is for nutrition programs and then the amount of money that is, is for the farm components of the farm bill. Um, so out of the other titles of the programs, uh, you are looking at the safety net programs. So the commodity title programs in Title I. You're looking at the crop insurance uh, program, which is Title XI. Uh, this bill also houses the conservation title. The conservation title uh, is the largest federal investment in private lands conservation. Um, and so those are programs that you may have heard of like uh, EQIP or the Conservation Stewardship Program or Conservation Reserve Program or the easement programs. Uh, and those programs help uh, uh, protect land, uh, help with water quality, quantity, wildlife habitat, air quality, uh, and, and, and protecting um, private farmlands. Uh, we have the trade title. Uh, there is limited jurisdiction in trade, but there are programs that help for market access uh, development. Um, programs uh, in, in credit. So if you're familiar with FSA and their direct lending programs or the guaranteed lending programs that some of their commercial bankers might use or, or the farm credit system that is all housed within credit. Um, we look at things like research, um, the rural development title, so your water systems, uh, your rural broadband programs, um, horticulture programs, and things that uh, delve into to pesticides. Um, forestry, the committee has jurisdiction over the national forest system and, uh, and issues related to forest health. Um, and so uh, those are a number of, of things. And then uh, a, a little bit on livestock as we work on livestock issues uh, in, the, in the miscellaneous uh, title. So that's kind of a general, I'm sure I've missed a few, but that's that's kind of a general uh, overview of what's covered within a farm bill. Is there any discussion of creating new titles for the farm bill this year or trying to take care of any new jurisdictional under existing titles? I think what, what we're hearing now from uh, out in the countryside is not necessarily a need uh, to increase the number of titles, but making sure that there are sufficient resources uh, with the existing program. And again, going back to making sure that there are sufficient resources uh, with commodity programs and, and crop insurance. I think as Mr. Thompson looks at some of these other programs, he's going to want to make sure we're streamlining programs and making sure that that USDA can deliver these programs more efficiently and that the end users uh, understand uh, and can adopt any any programs that they're participating in more efficiently. Speaking of the country and what you're hearing, I know you just got back from a listening session in Florida mm -hmm. and that just the latest in a long string of grassroots feedback that you guys are getting around the country. Uh, what are you hearing out there? What water on producers' minds, and not only producers, the other folks that uh, that have an interest in the farm bill? Uh, we'd be interested to hear what you're hearing. Um, you know, it's it's really interesting when you when you get to to travel um, across the country and hear from different regions. You know, uh, when the committee has been both to California and Florida this year, um, both heavily. Uh, in, in specialty crops, right? We're hearing a lot on limitations with uh, AGI limits, which may prevent producers uh, from uh, entering into uh, programs. We're hearing a lot on um, mechanization and the need for uh, more innovation uh, 
uh, within uh, harvesting those crops. Um, we're hearing things outside of the juris jurisdiction of the committee that um, are helpful to hear, uh, not necessarily for a farm bill, but for ag in general on the needs for uh, labor and issues related to uh, H2A and H2B uh, visas. Um, we're hearing about the need for um, uh, crop protection tools and making sure that EPA is going through a science-based process uh, when, when they're uh, advancing that. Um, and, and we're hearing about um, a lot with the high uh, costs in production and issues within the supply chain. Um, so those are a lot uh, going forward, but most importantly, I think what we're hearing uh, unified across the country is the need for certainty and the need to get a farm bill done um, and, and providing that certainty for producers. With the nutrition programs in the farm bill comprising about 80% of the expenditures, uh, that's, that's a big, big bucket of, of cash uh, related to the total. Um, what are, are there areas of the country or issues that came uh, to your listening session that some feedback from, uh, from feeding programs, from uh, healthcare professionals, from nutrition professionals, from the, from the nutrition community? Uh, was there some feedback that, uh, that might be important there? Yeah, so there, you know, the the trouble with the nutrition title and those nutrition programs, right, are there are a lot of folks with differing opinions. Um, I know that, um, you know, the one of the reasons why that uh, the program is around 85% of the farm bill spending is that it is a uh, an entitlement program. And so Congress does not necessarily put caps on the spending there. Uh, they have eligibility requirements. And if you meet those eligibility requirements, uh, then, the, then the funding for that uh, can grow. And so we've seen um, nearly a doubling uh, of the spending within that program since the authorization of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, so that tells you there's a need there, right? And But also we're going to have arguments on the other side on do you uh, restrict that eligibility or do you change that eligibility? And if you've been uh, uh, following along on the debt limit um, uh, debate that we're having right now, uh, do you expand the age on work requirements, which uh, right now the current debt uh, ceiling uh, bill that's probably going to go on the floor increases that, that work requirement uh, from the age of 49 to the age of 55. Um, so those are the issues uh, we're hearing about. I think that the chairman's going to want to focus on innovation within uh, uh, the nutrition programs. Are there ways uh, to use, um, you know, our current tools, whether it's uh, the Internet or the cell phone or your computer uh, for the delivery of, of foods? Um, are there uh, opportunities to work with food banks further? Are there opportunities uh, to uh, provide fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables uh, in a more meaningful way. So those are all discussions I don't think it, uh, he's taken a position on, but things that probably are gonna need to be hashed out and, and uh, uh, grappled with. We hear so much about conservation today uh, at the farm level, and that may mean one thing, uh, and to climate activists, it may mean another thing. And I know we've covered a lot of environmental stuff and mega, packages we've uh, passed uh, in the last couple of years having to do with climate change. Uh, a lot of that down at the grassroots soil level is, is, is agriculture and conservation. Um, mm -hmm. In your listening sessions, uh, did you hear different opinions on what conservation is, what it might do and what might be needed and how, and how that might relate to climate change? Yeah, so we, as you hear about the needs, um, they, they are, are, are somewhat different um, from region to region. And soil health probably means different things from region from region. And what is climate smart is different from region from region. And so what, what is important for the chairman is that the conservation programs remain voluntary and that they remain locally led. 
And so his real concern as you're looking at a farm bill is to make sure that these programs that Congress does not take a top down approach uh, to how these programs are implemented. He wants to make sure that uh, not any single uh, natural resource concern, whether it be climate or uh, water quality or water quality or air quality or wildlife habitat um, uh, takes precedent over any other. And that no practice, no conservation practice um, is dictated by Congress or prioritized um, by Congress. He wants to make sure that those decisions are made on the local level and, and that, um, you know, as we look at things that might be climate or climate smart, um, that they are not, uh, while they are important, that they are not taking precedent over what the landowner uh, wants or needs to do for their operation. Now, having said that, if, um, if a local area, everything they want to do is cover crops or everything they want to do is related to soil health or greenhouse gas reductions, that is perfectly fine. Uh, he just doesn't want Congress uh, dictating that to the landowners. Um, and again, leaving those decisions uh, at the local level. You know, the concern with Climate Smart going forward is um, who is determining what is Climate Smart, right? And then how does that, uh, and how does that actually um, show results in greenhouse gas reductions and soil health and things? So again, uh, not having uh, all of that done um, inside a black box and making sure that people are at the table um, having real conversations about what that looks like. Exactly. We appreciate that. Um, I think uh, I think probably your discussion will uh, focus a little bit on metrics, too, on some of the conservation, environment, and climate smart agriculture. Um, there are a lot of ideas out there. They might not all stand up uh, where they have to be measured with some kind of a metric for a real success. So we appreciate that. Um, another issue of, for, for today in, in that food and agriculture, uh, today meaning this time, uh, the dairy industry uh, is going through a, a little bit of a uh, self-examination on milk pricing and product pricing and et cetera. I do know that the uh, International Dairy Foods Association has petitioned the Secretary of Agriculture to uh, change the make allowance and, and that is the way to produce cheese, yogurt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the National uh, Milk Producers Federation, which is the producer side, says that's fine. We want to participate in that too, but we also at the same time need to look at this, uh, the the formulas, uh, the uh, the different uh, regions of the country uh, for the milk marketing order, and uh, all at the same time. Uh, and I believe that process at USDA is uh, maybe if, if the secretary rules that, that he's going ahead with it in about 120 days, and that's six months. So it looks like the uh, the petition, uh, the dairy petition, uh, will come to an end about the time the farm bill is supposed to come to an end. Uh, if there is a uh, impasse uh, on the uh, USDA side, uh, do you see a chance for the farm bill to take up uh, and decide this? That, that's a really good question. So uh, I don't know if Chairman Thompson likes this, but I call him the Dean of Dairy. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, uh, you know, that's probably one of the issues he's most passionate about uh, based on, you know, his his uh, districts and his district and constituents. Uh, and it's something he's been very active on. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of people who understand dairy policy. And there's not a, definitely not a whole lot of members that under, understand dairy policy, but he's one of them. Uh, and so he's going to be monitoring uh, this situation uh, very closely. Uh, as you pointed out, there is, uh, you know, the secretary and, and the groups are, are trying to work uh, uh, there towards uh, an agreement. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a benefit that um, the timing on all this kind of lines up. I think it's his hope that, that Congress doesn't have to step in. Uh, but to your point, um, the dates do align. So, so there is the flexibility there. That could be an interesting discussion on about next December. Uh, <laughs> I remember a few in the past. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'll also, uh, you know, not that he's looking to congressionally get involved, but um, Mr. Thompson's not afraid to 
um, you know, do things outside the farm bill. So not everything has to revolve around the farm bill clock. All right, might be a message in that. <laughs> Last question, and I will let and, and, and Josh, we really appreciate you jumping in. I know you're very busy. Uh, it's a good thing we're doing this in April because I don't want to try to get a hold of you about June or July or August. How does the chairman feel about research funding as we're falling behind China and the EU in funding for ag research and innovation? So, um, if you heard him, I'm, I'm, I didn't get to catch what he, he said before, but my, I'm most likely thinking he touched on science, innovation, and technology. Um, that's kind of his theme um, as, as he chairs this committee. He's hoping that um, every policy that Congress deals with that, that influences um, agriculture is viewed through that lens of science, technology, and innovation and making sure uh, that, that, that we are all working together towards increasing productivity uh, in the ag space. He likes to talk about uh, productivity, how, how research in science, technology, and innovation has increased uh, food production in the United States threefold uh, since the 1940s and done so with relatively no increase in inputs. And that is all based on uh, a, a lot based on the research through our land grant in, institutions. And you are very correct that uh, we have fallen uh, behind. So um, that's going to be on the forefront of discussion for our committee members. There are a number of bills out there um, looking to address more resources there. And those are going to be uh, uh, probably prime debate as we go forward and um, at a time when, when resources, extra resources, may or may not uh, be available. Um, but, um, you know, he's also an alumnus and, and represents Penn State University, another great land grant university. So um, it will be a priority discussion as, as, as he goes on. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I believe we just had a research hearing at the committee and it's probably the first one solely uh, focused on the research title um, that's been happening, uh, that's happened the last couple of years. So, um, that right there, I think, shows that it is a priority concern uh, for the chairman and this committee. Well, Josh, it's been a fantastic visit, and uh, we appreciate your bank of knowledge and your years of experience. And uh, we'll be looking forward to a, a great farm bill. And uh, again, that the uh, Grange can help you in any way or give you feedback or provide resources to get down to the grassroots where our strength is, why well, we'd be happy to do that. And we thank you so much for participating today. Well, I really appreciate the uh, invitation and, and y'all's engagement uh, and advocacy. Uh, so thank y'all and, and y'all been a great friend of the chairman. And, um, you know, we are here anytime y'all y'all uh, uh, y'all need to engage the committee. So thank you. We're going to switch gears, kind of like the old Model T Ford going ahead, two forward and one back. <laughs> um, no, the, the Grange uh, uh, is historically not over the 156 years been known uh, as a healthcare force. But that has changed because of our population and the circumstances and our geography in rural America, healthcare is becoming a major priority for the National Grange. We've asked a, a lady to come and speak to us who's probably got the, one of the best ideas for the 50,000 foot view of uh, healthcare in Washington of anybody we know. Uh, Janet Mikulski is founder and president of the Mikulski Health Board. And uh, if you're involved in grassroots or patient-oriented healthcare in Washington, you probably know Janet Mikulski. She's a nationally recognized expert and innovator in the field of stakeholder alliance development and programming. Her background encompasses work on Capitol Hill, campaign and issue management, strategic communications, and long-term experience working side-by-side -side with healthcare and patient advocates across the U.S. Janet was with Pfizer from 2001 to 2020, serving her entire tenure in the National Alliance Developed Arena, working to establish new a new manner of long-term trusting partnerships for the pharmaceutical industry with nonprofit patient advocacy organizations. As the Senior Director Advisor Janet developed many of the best class programs, including the Pfizer Health Advocate Leader Breakfast Series, 
which we are all participants of and then love that love that series put over the years that provided expert education and speakers for the nonprofit health care and advocacy community. Speakers included members of Congress, senior administration officials, media, and senior representatives from academia and from Pfizer. With Janet's leadership, Pfizer built out small and large educational and capacity building programs to enable the organizations to build a louder, impactful, credible voice on behalf of the, the chronically ill patients they serve. Janet is a graduate of Colgate University and George Washington University. And we really appreciate her coming today. And she formed her health force just a few years ago. And uh, it's it's a real force in, in the uh, animal of the uh, ag the healthcare, not agriculture, in the healthcare arena. And Janet, we appreciate you being here with us today. And uh, tell us what we're facing in Washington as we get challenges for rural health care. Thank you. Thank you, Burton. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, it's so nice to see so many friends. I don't want to say old friends, but friends, yeah. Leroy and, and Dick and yes, um, and Millicent. So, so I really, really appreciate the opportunity. And as, as Burton mentioned, um, I've had the pleasure of working with the Grange for more than a few years. Um, we were, as Carolyn Weems, who's on uh, on this um, Zoom with me and is part of the um, Health Force team, um, probably doesn't remember because she was probably in elementary school, um, when Part D was first um, <laughs> just, um in Washington, DC and, and put the prescription drug amendment onto Medicare. So seniors were able to get, seniors and disabled were able to get um, their prescription drug coverage. Grange was a critical partner in, in that work of really letting people know what was available to them and how it would be um, structured. And uh, a number of us were, traveling the United States, really trying to, with actually Senator Bob Dole, um, who I think many of you know, um, he was really very instrumental in reaching out to people all over the country. Um, and particularly in his generation at the time um, of letting people know how important it was um, to really sign up for Part D and have their prescription drug drugs covered. The Grange was an amazing partner then, and they're an amazing partner now for healthcare discussion and debate in Washington, um, whether it's to protect the safety of medicines, whether it's counterfeit drugs that are coming in that are really um, jeopardizing the health of so many people, advocating for the rural health policy, you know, protecting access and care and treatment, educating and advocating for greater awareness and better utilization of new prevention and treatment therapies, um, protecting against respiratory diseases, all of the work that has been done recently fighting COVID, um, whether it's through vaccines or through treatments or just knowing how to protect and preserve your health care, um, your health. Um, there are a number of organizations in Washington that uh, presume to speak on behalf of rural Americans, but we really feel that the Grange is considered the true voice of rural Americans um, because you touch on those, the really important rural issues, not just in healthcare, but more broadly as well. But as uh, Burton said, recent years, healthcare has been really very much top of the agenda of items that were being discussed and really important. Um, and it, we think it's what really makes the Grange unique. Um, you're a rural organization. Um, but you understand public policy and you understand the impact it has on your communities um, like there are no other organizations out there that do. Um, your recent PCORI grant in a large way is a, as an indication of the trust and understanding of the priority voice that the Grange has. Uh, for those of you who may not know our wonderful acronyms in Washington, PCORI is um, the Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute. I had to read it. Um, and is the gold standard on what is coming in healthcare uh, research. Um, so 
it's really an important project that the Grange is working on with them and the funding that the Grange has gotten to really help um, the under, build the understanding of what's going on um, in this space is really important. Um, when we look at where are we now though, we've done, we've done a lot with Part D, with ACA, with PCORI, um, we're really looking at a lot of really difficult challenges in the space of healthcare. Um, innovation has been really the success story of the healthcare field in Washington, um, whether it's immunotherapies or prevention with vaccines really coming out for so many different diseases. Um, as you may have read recently, there are a couple of companies, my alma mater, um, Pfizer has a, uh, one for Lyme um, that will be really exciting and we hope to see it in the next couple of years. And I think I just saw the other day that another company is developing one um, for Lyme disease too. Um, so we'll be seeing that. The whole issue of biologics, gene therapies, the continuing advancement is really exciting. And, um, you know, you have pneumococcal vaccines for pneumonia. Um, as we were talking about, my my mother, who's 88, um, got her new mode vaccine just the other day because um, she has Parkinson's, and one of the, actually the leading cause of death for Parkinson's is pneumonia. And so um, I said, we're going with the whole issue of self injectables that are able to be done in people's homes rather than having to travel to a doctor's office. Combination therapies that attack cancers in new ways. Um, you know, really looking for all these treatments and in fact, cures. Um, Francis Collins, who many of you may know the name, was the head of the NIH until just recently when he retired after 40 years, I think, as they had there, um, was talking about hepatitis C. We have a cure for hepatitis C. I mean, I don't know who would have thought Millicent Gorham, who was with the nurses for years, probably can tell you. You know, did we really think we would see a, a cure for hepatitis C in our lifetime? I mean, it's really exciting. But the problem right now that we're facing is budgets. You have all of these really exciting treatments and cures, but they all cost money. Um, the money that, you know, is as the budgets are being pushed and constrained and stressed, um, we see it in antimicrobial resistance, the antibiotics that we're always looking for, um, the new antibiotics as you develop, you know, as the resistance is developed, we need to get new ones out there. We're working in some ways to get some new incentives so that companies will look to in, engage in more R&D in the antibiotic area, which is a little challenging because you basically want to develop an antibiotic that you will put on the shelf and not sell because you want it to be there when the resistance develops to the current ones so that you have a new um, antibiotic that you can start using at that point, not a great commercial venture at that point, but we're working with the Congress and um, the different government agencies to set up some ways to maybe have some incentives so the companies will engage more in some of that research. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, I think most people have seen in the news what happened with Aduhelm, is the issue there, the new Alzheimer's drug that um, FDA passed, uh, approved the use, but then the CMS said they weren't going to pay for it, um, which is kind of a problem. If the FDA says it's approved, but we've got to think through all of that in, in a complex way because budgets are getting constrained. And then the other option is you have biosimilars, um, which are, for those of you who don't know, it's a biologic, I mean, don't tell anybody I said it, but you know, in some ways, it's the generic version of a biologic. Um, I, you know, I know who somebody laughed at me. I'm not supposed to say it that way, but I think it's the way you generally can understand it. A biologic being an organic compound, not a chemical treated, you know, a chemically produced product. So it, it actually is created somewhat differently. But it's in general, when you go off patent as a, bio, a biologic, then you can have biosimilars there. But there's lots of issues regarding the coverage 
and the whether people are going to be able to have access to these cheaper versions of biologic medications. So you have CDC, CMS needing to pick up the pace also on ensuring older Americans have the access to the latest vaccines. The Merck and Pfizer pneumo vaccines that were approved in June of, I'm going to go say it, 21, Carolyn, I think, that just actually got all their final, what's called MMWR, um, their, their final regulations weren't done for a year and a half um, so that people didn't have access to them because the insurance plans aren't going to cover them until all the documentation is done through the agencies. So we're working hard with CDC and CMS to say, get it going. You'll see a new vaccine, new vaccines coming out. A couple of companies will have one on RSV. If everybody saw it in the news, it was a big issue this past year. Are we going to take a year and a half to get those available for the, the folks that need them? And that's for both babies and for older Americans. It's really a problem. And so we're working to with groups like the Grange and others to try to encourage CDC and CMS to get moving on it. Lastly, I think it's worth touching on some of the health system roadblocks as a result of some of Carolyn wrote the corporate greed. And I, I think that's probably the way to talk about it, where you put the insurance companies in between patients and their doctors trying to, to you know, really control what's available to patients, even though, you know, it, it, we lose the fact that the doctor prescribes the best drug that they think is available for you. You ought to be able to get it. You should, your insurance company shouldn't be able to stand in your way, whether it's Require you know requiring a much higher copay or whether it's requiring step therapy, which means you've got to go through all the drugs that you've already failed on, um, and then before you can get the drug that you know that your doctor says you need. I mean that's kind of crazy and not where we, that not the healthcare system we want, but it's complicated and it's a you know a picture that has many moving parts. Um, the United States has you know, the premier healthcare system in the world. Why do you think people come from all over the world to have their surgeries and a lot of their healthcare, their cancer treatments and all, they come here. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we're looking to, to really make sure that we maintain that gold standard of the world. When you look at the COVID vaccines that were created so quickly, they were created quickly because so much of that research was already being done. Um, it was anticipated, if not for COVID, for a lot of other immune um, or different areas that you were going to need vaccines. So it was a, a process that was being worked on that they it could quickly pivot to, um, to a COVID vaccine. And so it's why you saw it developed in what was it? a year, a year and 16 months, something like that, you know, which is pretty amazing compared to what you've seen in the past. So thanks to the large part, you know, in, in continued R&D, you know, we're advancing. The research is coming. The treatments are coming. Hopefully more and more cures are coming. I, we think hep C could be a precursor to, you know, where we're really seeing cures. But we need people speaking out. We need people talking about why it's a priority. You know, the Grange's voice matters. The people that you represent matter. Talking about why you need more care in rural communities. I was at a breakfast this morning with members of Congress talking about why there's such a problem with labor and delivery in so many of the rural hospitals that, you know, I just think in such a broad range of healthcare topics and conversations, we need to be talking to Congress and the administration, why these issues are really important and why your fly-in is really important, talking about why your communities need this. Um, as I was looking through your website the other day, you know, I came across the Grange's motto and it's like, no time is more appropriate than in essentials, we have unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. I mean, what a fabulous, if we could all just embrace that motto and really take it um, to the congressman, to the, you know, um, to the public, to the administration. But 
I'll stop talking and say, we'd love to hear if there are some pressing healthcare issues in your communities in, with the membership that you have that we can work on. Are there things that are important to you, you know, working with your doctor, a family member, social media, tell us how we can help because um, Carolyn is on the Maryland Grange board. Is that right, Carolyn? Oh, sorry. That's advocacy, um, the advocacy board. There you go. So Carolyn's attuned to all of this. There you go, right? Yeah. And as many of you know, Nevaeh is also with our organization, who has been a dear friend to the Grange for years and years, and an advocate. So you've got a number of people on our team that really want to know how we can be helpful to your agenda, your priorities, and help represent uh, the folks that you talk to the most. So. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to have you. Okay, Millicent. Oh, how important is gaining broadband access to health, telehealth services to rural community? I, I punt that to your team, um, you know, whether it's Burton or I don't know who. Burton, do you want to address that? Surely, it's very important. Uh, some of the new innovations in telehealth uh, where a local clinic or local doctor can connect to a, a larger uh, practice or a hospital or a small hospital can connect uh, to uh, um, a major, major cancer clinic. Uh, that, that's just phenomenal. We're just getting that worked out. Still don't know what to pay for it's going to be and the fee schedules and some of that stuff may be bigger than the technology challenge. But uh, uh, telehealth is very important. As we lose hospitals and clinics and specialists in rural America, uh, being able to connect to those people who have, have the expertise and the experience will be very, very uh, critical. Now, we have one for you. Yes. <laughs> and I'm glad you're asking you and not me. What are the three questions in the healthcare arena should Grange members be asking candidates during in-person meetings, whether it be for president, senate, or the house representative? Good question. You know, I think probably one of the biggest issues right now is the issue when you look at between um, patients and their insurance. I mean, the whole issue of what the pharmacy benefit managers um, are, are doing to really cause these step therapy issues. I mean, I think um, what's the value of them? Where, where, what are they bringing to the, to the healthcare system at large? And I think you seeing a lot of both at the federal level in Congress, you've got a lot of people saying, if you're, you know, you, the PBMs and it gets a little complicated, but the PBMs are basically pocketing a good chunk of money that the patients are paying towards their premiums. Um, and you have the drug companies or whoever um, that are providing supplemental um, benefits to them. And it like none of it ever goes into the patient's pockets. Um, where is that, you know, the transparency of that finance, I think is really important that you understand what the insurance companies are taking, what the pharmacy benefit managers are coming and whether patients are getting the discounts that they need to be getting. Um, I, and I, I used the wrong word earlier. It's basically drug companies will say, if you put us on a higher tier or actually a lower tier, I guess, a less costly tier for a patient, we'll, we'll pay you a rebate. That's what the drug companies pay a rebate. But the rebate doesn't go to the patient. The rebate goes to the insurance company. And so one of the things that we've, we've been spending a lot of time and, and I think a lot of people should ask about is, Where's the transparency? Let us see where the money's going. Let's, you know, you feel like the shells that are going, where's the money going? So I would ask about pharmacy benefit managers. I would ask about um, the coverage. Where, where are you with, you know, um, you look at some of the preventative healthcare services. Um, you're supposed to have $0 copay. It all goes back to money. But, you know, when you look at the $0 copay, when you get vaccines or whether you get a mammogram or all of these things that are preventative health care, making sure that the plans, whether it's a government funded 
you know, Medicaid or Medicare, or if it's a commercial plan, that they're actually providing um, the zero dollar that they should be doing so that people go in and get their preventative health care. Okay, so that's two. I'm trying to think of a third. What would I ask? Carolyn, what else would you but, ask? Uh, I'll ask Nona's question that she came up with. How can rural Americans better make elected officials aware of the health care challenges that we face? So that's, I mean, it comes back to like, how can we share our personal experiences in a way that helps elected officials to better understand the issues and the challenges being faced and then to take that forward in terms of helpful policy? I think that's a great idea. I mean, my brother is a doc in upstate New York. Um, Right. I mean, right by the Canadian border. So he's in rural America and he takes care of a lot of the Amish children and all. And he just frequently talks about, you know, that their hospital is getting just fewer and fewer specialists. He's having to send the kids much farther away to get their care. I mean, are we are we funding our rural hospitals the way we need to? And this is way out of my area of expertise, but the, those are the, I mean, you guys hopefully are following that. And I think, I mean, I just think it's a huge, as I say, we're talking this morning about labor and delivery, you know, or, or you've got, do you have your local hospitals that have those? Millicent, you probably know more about that than anybody on this call, or at least more than me, but making sure that, you know, those challenges for the rural healthcare world are being addressed by the federal government or the state government or whoever. What are PBMs? Pharmacy benefit managers. And basically what that means is they manage for the insurance companies how what drugs are going to be covered and what are not going to be covered. It's a hot topic in D.C. right now um, because there is very little transparency, um, you know, uh, that of how much are they keeping? What are they passing through? Are they, if they get extra money from the drug companies to put the drug at a, at a less costly tier, does that go back to the patients or does that just stay in the pocket of the PBM? It's a big issue. Congress has had a couple of hearings recently and we're hoping we're gonna get some forced transparency. Yeah, you know, we we said we're we're behind that bill 100. Uh, percent We're not trying to accuse anyone of anything. We just want transparency and that's uh, right. Put it all on the table. Let's look at it and see where the where the costs are going and where the money's going. Um, probably a last question, but uh, in general, um, would you say the patient community nationwide is is concerned, not concerned, very concerned? about uh, the issue of a drug being approved by food and drug to either cure or treat an illness, but CMS not approving it because of Medicare payment policies or some other issue. Um, do we have a pay for issue between uh, a, uh, a an effective drug and, and uh, who might be able to provide it at what cost? I mean, I think the patient advocacy community is hugely concerned about that because right now, let's be candid, the, the judge in Texas is talking about an, uh, an abortifacia medicine, which tends to polarize a lot of the political community. But when you, it's not just about that. You look at, you talk to the cancer community and they're saying like, so this judge over here you know, wherever that can be, is decides that we don't think that the FDA has properly reviewed a new cancer treatment. And therefore, I'm going to say it's not available. And you just think, how, how is a judge who doesn't have any medical background, who doesn't have, hasn't reviewed the clinical trial data, hasn't done any of that, can just decide that the FDA hasn't properly done their review the FDA, who has been considered by the world to be the gold standard, most countries, if the FDA approves a drug, their agent, their regulatory agency will approve it fairly just simply because the FDA approved it, because they know how careful and thorough the FDA is. So for a judge 
in a, you know, in a federal court to simply decide who has no science background. I, I just think it's, it's outrageous. The community is up in arms. There's a letter that's been signed by 75 of the major national patient advocacy groups saying this just can't work. Otherwise, why do we have an FTA if you're going to have a judge that can do that? Um, so I think I think it's a really important issue that needs to be. Now, the good news is it appears the Supreme Court pushed back on it this week or uh, within the past week um, because it doesn't appear that they they think that's inappropriate. But it's a little scary when you when you see that happening. And we got to just all be vigilant. We got to watch it. And we got to engage. Well, good. We are out of time. About 66 left. And uh, as we uh, do on so many uh, of these programs, uh, you have the last word. I appreciate everything the Grange is doing. The rural community really voice is loud and strong and just needs to continue on. And then we re really appreciate all the work the Grange does to allow that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. We, we appreciate it, Janet. Thank you for all you do to keep us informed of things that are going on. And uh, thank you for being on today. Thank you. Bye. Switching gears once again, uh, we're moving into the telecommunications arena, which in everything we've done um, so far today, uh, touches on telecommunications, whether it's smart agriculture, uh, in the first discussion, uh, or, or research and technology, uh, whether it's telehealth in the uh, health community uh, discussion, and now it's uh, talking about the general population uh, being reached with uh, telecommunications. We are uh, asking uh, Jenna Alsega, the Strategic uh, Director of, Innovate, uh, of Initiatives and Partnerships at U.S. Telecom, the Broadband Association, to give us an overview of uh, where we are in telecommunications uh, in general, uh, in broadband all over the country, how we're doing uh, in getting out uh, the congressional mandate of serving the unserved first, the underserved next, and everybody else uh, when we can come back to the, uh, with enough funding and come back up the road and, and get them hooked in. Jenna manages the association's relationships with various advocacy organizations to advance policies related to expanding access to connectivity. She also leads member coordination on the association's advocacy around state level legislation impacting the broadband industry. Jenna serves on the Federal Trade Commission's Consumer Education Committee, as well as on the Federal Communications Common Equity and Diversity Council Working Group, focused on diversity and equality. Over 10 years of public service, experience, Jenna previously worked as a senior associate at the Dewey Square Group, where she provided strategic communications and glass, grassroots support for a variety of clients in the private and nonprofit sectors. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Franklin and Marshall College. She currently re resides in Washington, D.C. And uh, we appreciate uh, Jenna uh, giving us where the telecommunications commu uh, community is right now and the challenges we're looking ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Burton, for that introduction. Um, let me see if I can just get my slides up here to share with you all. There we go. Okay, so thank you again, Burton. Um, and it's great to be with all of you here today. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with US Telecom, we represent the traditional wireline broadband providers. Um, so our largest members are um, national providers like AT&T, Verizon, Lumen, and Windstream. Um, but the majority of our members are smaller, more regional companies, um, some of which were founded over 100 years ago when their first businesses were stringing telephone lines through their communities and then over the years have um, evolved to provide more modern technologies like fiber. Um, and so um, our main goal at our association is universal connectivity. Um, so we're focused on how we can work with government to address the current barriers um, to deployment. And today I'm going to provide some updates on some of the federal um, funding opportunities that are available, 
as well as some of the policies that we've been advocating for on the Hill, at state broadband offices and federal agencies to address this. Um, and then I'll also um, talk a little bit about our team's work on illegal robocalls, because I know that can be a big headache for everybody. And so I'll share some of the work that our team is doing on that front. So first, I just wanted to take a step back um, and take a look at the, the challenge that we're um, currently facing with the digital divide. Um, and so it really comes down to three main things, geography, density, and funding. And so if you look at this diagram, you'll see that the internet can be broken down into three different parts. And so the first mile is the global internet network. The middle mile is that infrastructure that connects um, the global network to, or the uh, uh, centralized network to the global network. And then the last mile is that last bit of connection between your house, a business, your farm, and the more centralized part of the network. And the further these locations are from each other, the less that you can share the cost of the infrastructure. So if an area is lower density, more rural, it's gonna be a lot more expensive to reach that, that location. Um, and as I mentioned, you also have to take into account geographies. So it's gonna be a lot more expensive to build in a mountainous area as opposed to a flatter rural area. In some places, it can be as much as $100,000 per location in the last mile. And that's where our companies really start running into the challenge of being able to serve these places, um, because a company just is never going to be able to recover the cost without the help of any type of um, government subsidy. So this is one area where we're trying to work with government to figure out how federal funding can help. So there have been various programs over the years for broadband, but we have seen an unprecedented amount of federal funding in the last few years, which is really exciting. Um, back when the pandemic hit, I'm sure you remember the renewed sense of urgency to make sure everybody was connected, be able to work remotely, attend classes online, reach their doctors virtually. And in response to that, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, and that allocated around $350 billion to the states, um, of which could be used for, for broadband. Um, and then the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IJA, dedicated an additional $60 billion to broadband programs. And this includes funding for things like the BEAD program, the ACP, um, and then providers also had the opportunity to apply for funding through RUS and RDOF. Um, and then the farm bill um, will also likely be reauthorized later this year. So that will be another opportunity for funding. So this is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity to address the digital divide. But the closer we get to 100% connectivity, the more expensive it gets to serve those final locations. So we want to make sure that um, all the federal funding is being spent effectively as possible so that we can reach as many um, unserved locations as possible. So next, I'll dive deeper into the BEAD program. So the IIJA allocated $42.5 billion to this program. The funding is distributed through the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA, and they're responsible for allocating it to the states. And so every state has their own broadband office that designs um, the program for allocating these funds to providers in their, in their state. And right now, um, the broadband offices are focused on meeting with local communities and organizations to gather info on how best to structure their programs. So if you haven't already, this is a great opportunity for you to touch base with them and just share your perspective, talk about the specific needs of your community. Um, and you can find that information on internetforall.gov, um, the, the right people to contact in your state. And so the next big milestone is June 30th, um, and that's when NTIA will release the beat allocations to the states. That will start a 180-day shot clock during which states will submit their initial proposals for how they plan to structure their beat programs. And then they'll have um, some additional time to work on their proposals and then have um, four years to complete their projects. The other really important piece to this is identifying the unserved locations to, to determine how much funding to go to each state. Um, and the FCC's new broadband maps will be used for this. What's great about them is that they provide much more granular data than the previous FCC maps. Um, the previous maps were based on census block data. So if your home had service, but your neighbor didn't, that entire census block would be labeled as served. 
um, which obviously is, a, is um, not ideal. So the new maps have data that's so granular, it can actually differentiate between um, different buildings on a property. So if a house has broadband, but a barn or a chicken coop on the same property doesn't, that should be reflected in the map. And these maps are meant to improve over time through a challenge process. So the first challenge process took place earlier this year, and the next iteration of the maps will be available in June. And this is the version that will determine BEAT funding um, for the states. Um, but you can continue to submit challenges to help make the maps as accurate as possible over time. And so um, if you haven't checked this out yet, I encourage you to. Um, you can go to www.fcc.gov slash um, broadband data to look up your address and see if the information is accurate. So we have a lot of funding, um, we have better maps, but how do we make the most of this opportunity? So the US telecom team has been meeting with several state broadband offices um, and Congress and NTIA to share a perspective on this. And these are the main points that we've been emphasizing. So first, it's really important to target the money to unserved areas first. We wanna make sure that states are spending their funding wisely and not using it to overbuild in areas um, that already have service. Our Hill team is also pushing Congress to pass legislation to eliminate the tax on broadband grants. And we wanna make sure that providers can deploy to as many locations as possible. And so if they have to return one out of every $5 they receive, that can really limit their reach into unserved areas. The BEAD program also has a Buy America requirement. And so what that means is providers then are required to buy all of their network equipment from American companies. And while that's a well-intentioned goal, it can't be at the expense of the goal of universal connectivity. So the truth is we simply just don't have the domestic capacity right now to meet that requirement. So our team has been talking um, with NTIA about establishing a waiver for this. Uh, we also wanna make sure that states are working with experienced providers and streamline, streamlining the permitting process. And then affordability, of course, is another big priority. Um, and so I'll provide some more detail in those last three points on the next slides. So when states are choosing providers, it's really important that they're choosing providers that have the financial resources and expertise to build a secure network and also to have the ability to maintain it over an extended period of time. Um, there are some who are pushing to prioritize government-owned networks, but history has shown that these projects tend to struggle a lot. Um, if you take Kentucky, for example, um, back in 2014, they started a project to bring high-speed internet all across the state. But by 2018, that project um, had already exceeded its budget of $400 million, um, And now it's expected to, to um, cost taxpayers over a billion and a half over the next th 30 years. Um, so the path that we found to be most successful is one that involves a partnership between the local community and a private provider. And several of our members have um, participated in this type of partnership. Um, there's a city in Arkansas that recently partnered with Ritter Communications to upgrade its city to an all fiber network. Ritter also um, allocated some of its own private investment in the project. And then Consolid Com Consolidated Communications has also been partnering with towns across um, New England. And they've had a great track re record of completing their projects ahead of time and within budget. So this partnership between local communities and experienced providers has really been beneficial to consumers. And it's just been a great way to ensure that federal funding is um, being used efficiently. So another big issue is the permitting process. So I know a lot of our members have run into issues where they were, you know, they have the equipment, they're ready to build, but they get held up because they can't get their permits. And sometimes there aren't enough staff to process the applications. Um, if your service area is somewhere like Montana, where you really only have two months um, out of the year to build because otherwise the ground is just too cold, you just can't afford to have any delays with permitting. Um, and thankfully, Congress actually had a hearing last week to address this issue. Um, they covered 32 different bills, um, some of which would increase transparency in the application process, remove time and cost barriers over time, um, and remove discrepancies in poll attachment rates. Um, so we're hoping to see those bills move forward and our Hill team um, is actively talking to members on the Hill about this. Um, we're also seeing states 
address this issue in a constructive way. Um, so Indiana, for example, started what is called their broadband ready program. And the program outlines how a community can streamline permitting proce procedures to expedite the deployment process. And if a community does this, um, they're certified as broadband ready, which signals to the providers that they shouldn't really run into any setbacks in that community. Um, and if you wanna learn about other examples of permitting issues that come up, you'll see um, part of an infographic that we have over here, the road to broadband deployment. Um, and it's just a nice visual that, that walks you through the steps of planning, engineering, and then deploying an, a, a broadband network and some of the issues that our members um, can run into when it comes to things like permitting. And that's available on our state um, broadband solution center. So the other important piece of ensuring everyone has connectivity is of course, making sure that it's affordable for everybody. And so US Telecom conducted a study on broadband pricing recently. Fortunately, it found that broadband prices are decreasing when compared to other goods and services, such as food, rent, car and health insurance, um, especially when you take into account inflation. So this is really good news, but obviously affording broadband is still a challenge for some. And that's why the ACP is such an important part of ensuring the BEAD program is a success. And so this program received $14.2 billion from the IAJA. And so eligible households receive $30 per month for internet service. And the other great thing is that they, they can combine this with low-cost programs that companies provide. So in some cases, they can even get broadband for free. And so about a third of eligible households have enrolled in this program, but the funds are expected to run out by the middle of next year. So we really need to find a way to extend the funding. And there are a couple of ways that this can happen. So the first um, path is appropriations, and that's a good fix in the short term, but we wanna find a longer term fix so that we don't have to keep going through the appropriations process year after year. And so another solution could be to fund the ACP through the Universal Service Fund. And the current funding mechanism for USF though is really outdated. Um, it relies on US landlines, which is just unsus unsustainable given that the number of homes with landlines continues to decrease. So there have been conversations happening about how to modernize this funding mechanism by expanding the base of um, contributors. And by doing that, um, we would have plenty of funding to support both the ACP as well um, as other upkeep of rural networks in the longer term. So we're encouraging Congress to look into this. Um, there's a hearing coming up actually either next week or the following week um, that will focus on the future of USF. So we'll be um, monitoring that hearing. And I also encourage all of you to talk to your representatives about extending funding for the ACP and the importance of modernizing USF because it's really, really an important piece of bringing broadband to everybody, particularly um, in rural areas. So that's what's going on um, in the broadband space. I'll just give a quick update on what our robocall team has been up to. Um, so US Telecom leads the industry traceback group, um, also known as the ITG. And they've been playing a really big role in mitigating illegal robocalls. So this is just a brief timeline of where the ITG started back in 2015 um, to a couple of years ago when the FCC designated it as the official traceback consortium. And so the ITG developed a traceback portal that allowed industry to collect and analyze data about evolving robocall patterns and their sources much more efficiently. And so as you see in this graphic, what the ITG will do is trace an illegal robocall from the recipient to the caller, and that's what's known as a hop. And they usually go through at least four hops before identifying the originator of the call, and if that call entered the US where it originated internationally. Once they have that data, um, they share it with the providers who've been impacted, as well as government agencies, so including the DOJ, FBI, the FCC, um, FTC, and others. So before the ITG, this process would take several months. But now the average time to complete a traceback has fallen to just a matter of days, um, two to three days to be exact. Um, and providers are responding within 30 minutes when they're notified about something um, fishy that's been going on in their network. And the time to complete an individual hop is, taken, is now taking less than one day. So um, the ITG process has um, completely revolutionized the way that we go after the bad actors behind illegal robocalls. 
Um, and if you take a look at these two graphs, you'll see how effective they can be in just a year. Or so at the beginning of um, 2022, car warranty robocalls peaked at over a billion a day. They're basically non-existent now. And we're also seeing a similar trend with student loan robocalls as well as, uh, which you'll see on the right graph here. So I'll stop there. Um, and here's an overview of some of the resources that I mentioned. Um, all of these are available on our State Broadband Solutions Center, which you can um, find at ustelecom.org slash our priorities slash state action center. Um, and then I also have a link here for our robocalls um, page if you want to learn more about that. Um, that will open it up to questions. Well, we'll start you with a couple. Um, what do we do next on robocalls? Uh, it looks like we're making you, the industry is making tremendous progress. Um, what, what can we expect over the next 12 months? Um, so I can't pinpoint anything in particular, but, you know, I'll just emphasize the great thing about um, our robocall team is that they're very nimble. Um, they've evolved over the, the last few years to really just um, pivot to wherever, wherever the new um, threat is. Um, you know, they're always looking for new partners, new organizations that they can work with to gather more information. Um, so I, I think really that's that's what you can expect moving forward. Okay. So we're seeing a few come in uh, on the chat and I got a couple here that uh, have already come in. Um, are we sticking to the mandate of Congress and, and are you seeing this being here too through the providers that your group uh, monitors? And that is that the high speed uh, funding for broadband deployment must go to the unserved first underserved second and then everybody else. Yes, absolutely. So that is definitely um, one of our priorities, making sure that the unserved locations are targeted first. Um, that's why um, we're just so excited about um, the FCC's new broadband map, because that really is going to be such a helpful tool um, in figuring out um, which locations truly are unserved. Um, and then of course, you know, we do want to bring um, um, broadband um, to underserved areas as well, but we do have an, um, we don't have a, an unlimited amount of funding um, through BEAD. So we really need to be um, efficient and targeted um, where we decide to allocate those funds. Are you seeing all of the above technologies, uh, uh, philosophy uh, uh, per permeating through the provider industry? In other words, if it costs too much money to do it one way and there's a cheaper option that's uh, maybe just about as effective. Uh, are we are we seeing that implemented out there or is everybody uh, basically stuck on uh, high-speed fiber? Sure. Um, so yeah, um, fiber certainly has been prioritized um, through the BEAD program and, and some other um, broadband funding programs. But I think, I mean, I know that we understand and I, and I think um, the various agencies also understand that there are some areas where fiber just doesn't make sense. Um, and in those cases, um, you know, I think there is an understanding that it's important to figure out another technology solution to serve those areas. Okay. Um, this may be a little bit of a rhetorical question, but are we, and I'll ask our next speaker about the same thing, are we pretty much on track, you think, to uh, our timeline and money to, to move ahead as Congress intended? Um, with with the the funding uh, outlays and uh, the priority uh, deployment and the timelines and that type of thing. Sure. Um. So I think I think overall yes. Um. I it what I've been hearing in my meetings with various state broadband offices is that people are in different timelines at the state level. So. Even before BEAD, there were some um, states that had broadband um, teams or broadband offices in place. And so they kind of um, had a head start um, before everybody started thinking about this. And so some states are, you know, further ahead than others. But, you know, I think the great thing is that um, I do know that they talk to each other and we've been encouraging them to share um, best practices and resources with each other. Um, that that example I shared in Indiana about the broadband um, 
uh, broadband community make broadband ready communities. <laughs> Um, I, I think is what it was called. Um, and that's something that we've been promoting to the other states because we just know that that's um, a best practice that's been really working for them. And we're hoping um, with that kind of coordination that that we will be able to stay on track. Sure, I agree. Um, the state broadband agencies, they are at different stages of being uh, stood up and implemented. And some, some states already had their office in place when the uh, legislation was passed and others had to almost start from scratch. Um, our, a lot of our people are just now understanding that they can contact their state broadband agency. In your uh, expectations of, of, of the industry, I presume that most states uh, would have something that would make it easy to Google and find their state broadband agency to get feedback. I, a lot of our folks were involved in uh, challenges to the broadband map, that was, that was great because uh, they understood that they could get a look at the map and they engaged in the agency. And uh, lo and behold, their whole road was not on the map and uh, it had been on the map before. And that kind of thing. Um, uh, is it pretty easy for the common man to just Google their broadband agency by state? Yes, absolutely. Um, and again, I'll just um, highlight the um, website on, on the FCC's website where you can do this. Um, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I do have it in this presentation. And um, and I believe all of you will have access to it afterward. But I've gone through this process. It's pretty easy. I looked at my home. Um, I actually grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania. So it was really cool to see you know, that, oh, my home is served, but actually our barn is not. And, and it was really cool to see that data. And it was pretty, it was pretty easy too. If, if you needed to submit a, a challenge, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and there are um, instructions on their website as well. Great. Uh, one, one question that uh, burns through a whole lot of folks uh, in different parts of the country, it, it depends on where you are in the country to some extent, but it's a major issue. I know it's come, come across your desk many times. And that is poll access and rights of way. And uh, just what are you hearing about the improvement in those negotiations? Uh, is that continuing to be a major problem? And uh, we've been waiting for FCC, uh, FCC guidance document for several months uh, on, uh, on mitigation and uh, mediation. Uh, what are you hearing? Sure. Um, and so... This issue, um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with it, um, the poll attachment rates issue is really about um, that there are certain rates that are set for all poll owners, um, except for some entities like co-ops and municipalities. And um, it really only becomes a problem when um, those co-ops start directly competing in the broadband business um, by charging their competitors two to three more times than the regulated rates that other um, um, providers are allowed to charge for access to their, their pools. So um, we personally would, would love to see a more level playing field there. Um, I don't know um, when we should expect to hear anything from the FCC. But I do the <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, listen, we've got a couple more. Uh, and I think your answer, uh, you alluded to that. Uh, there Are there low-cost loans uh, in rural towns that can uh, tap into Pfizer and uh, uh, into uh, the fiber of the deployment programs and keep the cost affordable to the end user? Our next speaker may address some of that. But uh, are there are there loans uh, that the programs in rural towns can use to tap into uh, affordable fiber? Sure. So I, I do think that, um, you know, they they do have the opportunity to apply through BEAD. Um, and, you know, I think um, our hope is that they would um, would think of the public private private partnership model um, in doing so, um, because as I um, shared earlier, that really has been um, a successful path forward that we've seen. And probably I'll try to keep this last question, but um, we had a question last week from somebody saying, is there a uh, uh, demand on uh, providers that uh, that they provide service in an area? In other words, if I'm a major company in an area, and is there is there a certain demand that I have to provide that service? And 
you know, you can answer that, then there's no restriction on the area. I mean, you can have multiple providers, whoever might think that they can make a profit and they've been in for the, for the process, I presume that uh, the uh, the areas are wide open for whoever can provide it. If, if I've got a major company that's been really slow to, me, to hook me up in rural America, another provider can come in and do that without any issue or any restrictions, right? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that does get to um, the issue that the bead program um, was created to address. Um, when you get into those really deep rural areas, it just becomes a huge economic challenge. And so, um, sure, I mean, if if um, no provider has come to an area yet, I mean, that's that's an open opportunity. Um, but you know, I also think that's you know the great opportunity that we have here with the bead program. Um, for government and our and our um, private providers to work together to reach those areas. Well, Jenna, we're going to have to let you go because uh, we've probably kept you over time. You probably have something else that's pretty demanding. We thank you for being uh, on with us, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you and your organization. Uh, you keep us informed, and you draw us all kinds of interesting graphs that make us understand a complicated problem. So uh, thank you for the partnership, and... Uh, Thank you for uh, bringing us this overview and, and answering some tough questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And, and we really appreciate the Granger's partnership. Well, we're fortunate to have our next speaker in the room with us. And she's been listening to the whole discussion. And uh, she probably is uh, thankful that she's last because she's had a lot of time to formulate <laughs> her thoughts. Um, the USDA's Rural Utility Service uh, provides much needed infrastructure or infrastructure improvements to rural communities. These include water, waste treatment, electric power, and telecommunications services. All of these services help to expand economic opportunities and improve the quality of life for rural residents. Laurel Leverier is the Assistant Administrator of USDA's Rural Utility Service. The Rural Utility Services Telecommunications Programs, where she oversees the RUS program for five billion dollar portfolio of telecommunications loan and grants. That's why I say the next person is going to answer a whole lot of our last mile of rural America questions. Uh, Laurel is uh, is responsible for getting out five billion dollars into rural America in loans and grants, and uh, that is not part of the programs uh, that we just talked about here. And so this is this is when it came before and separately. So that's great. During her 18 year career at USDA, Laurel has served a variety of positions and has participated in a number of federal programs, including the American Broadband Initiative. Laurel is a graduate of American University's key executive leadership program and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in business administration and economics from Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. Laurel, it's good to have you here today, and thank you, and I'm sure you'll we'll have some questions. Thank you so much, Burton, and thanks so much for having me here when uh, Burton said you can participate virtually or you can come in person. I couldn't wait to be here in person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've spent a lot of time teleworking from home these days, and it's nice to actually be out and about here in Washington, D.C., and couldn't have asked for a prettier day to be downtown. So thank you all. Um, I think this is my first time presenting to the American Grange, uh, and thank you guys for inviting me. I'm so impressed by, at the beginning, we were talking about the focus areas of your organization, and agriculture, healthcare, and telecommunications broadband are three topics that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, I grew up in uh, the suburban area in Kansas, and um, gained a passion for rural America and economic development in rural towns while I was attending Westminster College. There's so many communities across the nation that um, are beautiful, vibrant towns that we want our communities to continue to grow. We want children growing up in those towns to stay in those communities and have opportunities. And I have a real passion for broadband because I believe it is the item that's going to enable our rural communities to have that resurgence where children can go to school uh, to obtain advanced education and have opportunities for new jobs, living wherever they want to live. 
Uh, when I was graduating from college, I didn't have those opportunities. If I wanted to take the job that I wanted, uh, the option was come to Washington, D.C. and commute here every day or don't take the job. And what's amazing is today in this remote work environment, uh, we're hiring folks all across the country. And I get a lot of pushback from people. Well, how can you guys operate as well from home in a work remote environment? I say, we be better. Because quite frankly, we have this amazing applicant pool. When we put our jobs out today, instead of just fighting for folks that live in the Washington DC region, we're able to expand our opportunities to folks all across the country. And we're able to get a caliber of um, employees that I, I could never have imagined five or 10 years ago. Um, I get asked all the time, why is USDA involved in broadband? It's a good question. Um, and it comes with a little bit of a history lesson. And it starts with uh, the New Deal. And at the time, uh, FDR and, and folks were trying to figure out a way to get electricity across the country. And um, they decided to create REA, the Rural Electrification Administration. And when they were trying to decide, well, where should we put this federal group? It was decided to house it within USDA because USDA was already on site, on the ground, serving rural communities. And while uh, 15, 18 years ago, when I first joined the agency, I kind of felt like the stepchild of USDA. You know, everything's about ag, everything's about food. But now it's quite amazing to me how it has all really come together, where uh, there's a huge partnership at our agency between our ag producers and the broadband work that we're doing. Um, I have the pleasure of serving on the FCC's Precision Act Task Force, just in an, an advisory role. And it's amazing to me how our ag community is really driving the work that we're doing when it comes to telecommunications and broadband. You know, when I first joined the agency, we talked about a lot about connecting every home and wanting every home to have access. And over the last couple of years, we really changed that um, terminology and talked about connecting every acre. Because from our standpoint, it is connecting every acre that needs that broadband service in order for us to have a vibrant agricultural community. Um, at USDA, I have the pleasure of overseeing five different programs. Most of our programs are, provide, are focused on providing funding in the form of grants or low interest loans to expand broadband access in our rural communities. But I think interesting for this group, I also want to highlight our distance learning and telemedicine program that Michaela brought up earlier. Um, so over the course of the next couple of minutes, I'll try to touch, touch base a little bit on where we stand with those programs and what we're doing, and also uh, share some success stories, hopefully, on the work that we're doing. I want to start with our ReConnect program, which is the largest program that I oversee. And it started in 2018, right as uh, Congress was putting together the Farm Bill at the time. And there was a lot of conversation on the Hill and interest in expanding rural uh, broadband access, but they weren't really sure how to do it. And we talked a lot about needing not just loan funding, which is what our, our agency has historically been providing, but also grants so that we could really help leverage access in areas where that financial incentive is just really hard and that financial case is really hard to make. So we started that program in 2018 uh, through $600 million in appropriations uh, through the appropriations bill that year. Um, since that time, we've been lucky enough to receive additional appropriations in every one of those appropriation cycles. And um, also we're lucky enough to, uh, to receive almost $2 billion through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Now, you guys have heard a lot about the huge amount of federal funding that's out there for broadband, and that's so true. Uh, we have over $60 billion allocated between the FCC, the Department of Commerce, and, and my group at USDA. At USDA, quite frankly, from a numbers perspective, we're a really small part of larger pie of funding. Uh, but we think we play a really important part um, and want to try to do not just in overseeing our programs and making sure the work is getting done with our programs, but also advocating for rural America. Um, you know, it's maybe not surprising to you guys, but was a shock to me when I came to Washington and started talking with policymakers here that there was such a disconnect between what are the actual challenges that our rural Americans are facing and the type of funding and access that we were trying to provide. And so we really try to advocate for our rural communities 
not just through our programs, but in the interagency work that we do in talking with our partners at the SCP at the Department of Commerce. And uh, we're, I, mean, I know that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for all of our agencies to receive this type of funding and to make this type of a commitment in our rural communities. And we talk a lot about how it's really important for all of us uh, coming together and each of our pieces coming together in order for us to finally close that digital divide. One of the things that uh, we're focused on at USDA, again, thinking about our reconnect program is ensuring that those loans and grants are going out to the most rural unserved areas and also that we're providing that funding in a timely manner. You asked about how are we doing as agency in meeting our commitments. Um, with respect to our reconnect program, since we received our first allocation of funding in 2018, we've awarded over $3 billion in award funds, both loans and grants, to uh, providers and communities across the country. And we're actively monitoring the build out of those projects. I get asked all the time, how can we make sure these projects are actually delivering on the commitment that they, they made? And at USDA, we take that really seriously. We're lucky enough to have what we call general field representatives, which are folks that are located all across the country. And their job is to be the primary point of contact with our clients, but to also go out and, and validate and ensure that these providers are providing the quality of service that they committed to. You know, one of my reasons for coming here and being in person is that even though I live in suburban Bethesda, sometimes my broadband service is better and sometimes it's not so good. And I, I you know, you suddenly start to, to notice that your mouth and the words that are coming out aren't going at the same speed. And as a presenter, there's nothing worse than thinking, oh my gosh, this technology is not meeting the needs that I need or that I want at this moment. And, you know, the pandemic taught us uh, a really hard lesson, which is that Broadband is not something that's nice to have. It's a necessity for rural communities across the country to have access to. So we're actively monitoring our 282 awarded projects, those $3 billion in awards, to make sure those uh, projects are successful in deploying that service and delivering the quality of broadband that we want to see. Um, and I'm pleased to report that we, at this point, have over a dozen projects that have already completed construction of their projects and we're serving thousands of people across the country. One of those companies I'd love to highlight is Dovetail Communications in Georgia. You know, it's a local telecommunications uh, company that has been in service for over 50 years, uh, providing started as telephone service, and, and now they're a broadband service provider. But one of the things that's really neat about that particular project is at USDA, we have a Buy American standard. So all of our projects have to use American-made goods to deliver, to deliver their service. We know sometimes that can't happen and we do have a process where individual companies can come to us and get waivers if they don't have a domestic uh, product that's an option. But it's a really big cornerstone of our program and something that we've been requiring for decades. Um, and in particular, Dovetail, not only shows a domestic product, but the fiber that they're using to deploy service was actually manufactured in one of the counties where they're serving people. And um, I decided not to use my slide deck today, so I'm sorry you guys won't see, but there, I have a great picture of, of the CEO from that Dovetail Communications on site when they were connecting the first house to this new system. And what was really special about it is a couple things. Number one, the person that they connected actually works for the fiber manufacturer that they're serving. And immediately when they started deploying the service, he ran out to see, to look and see what fiber it was. And he knew immediately, wait, I made that. That's made right here. And so that was really great to see that really local connection that we're making through the program. Additionally, um, the house that was connected, there are two young men who live in that house. And when they had to do their homework in the past, they used to have to go to Chick-fil-A. They either go inside or sit outside in the, in the uh, parking lot and get their homework done. And uh, one of the young men shared while we were there that he used to get made fun of by his friends because he lived in this house that didn't have broadband. He had to go to Chick-fil-A every night. And he said, now he has the fastest broadband service of any of his friends. 
So to me, that's that's like what we're trying to do, right? Making sure that we're not just providing robust broadband service, but we're creating opportunities for these kids to be successful. How successful can you be doing your homework in a parking lot? And I'll tell you what, I'm the mom of a third grader and it's hard enough for me to get her to sit there in my kitchen and get her homework done. I can't even imagine if we were distracted and we had to be in our car. And so it makes me really proud that we're able to provide these, uh, to fund these projects that can provide that critical access to educational resources for our community. Um, for the reconnect program, we're actually in our fourth funding window. Um, and I won't won't be a surprise to any of you. We advertise $1.1 billion of funding being available in this fourth funding window, and we received over $4.3 billion of applications, which says to me we continue to just have such a demand and need for funding in order to extend critical broadband service. Uh, we have gotten through a good number of our reviews. We're still processing those applications. Uh, we've announced three successful awardees so far this round, and we're on track to finalize and wrap up those awards in the next month to two months. And we're hoping to announce all of the successful awardees in the spring and into this summer. Uh, once we finish up this funding window, we will have exhausted all of the funding for our reconnect program that we received under the bipartisan infrastructure law. So we're really proud that we were able to get those funds out there and support these entities across the country to deliver that service. So we'll continue to be working diligently. We have another funding window, our fifth round of funding that we're looking to open up later this year that will leverage the funds we received under the appropriations bill this year. Um, and we're hoping that that funding window will be announced sometime in like the November, December timeline. So we're going to continue reviewing applications, making awards, and diligently monitoring the build out of those projects. While I'm with you guys, I also want to take the opportunity to highlight our distance learning and telemedicine program and what a program it is. It supports, uh, just as the name would tell you, distance learning and telemedicine projects. But what's so amazing to me is I joined the agency in 2004, and we were during this program, but the projects that we're funding today are entirely different. And really things we could have never imagined when we were first operating the program in the early 2000s. Technology is constantly evolving and changing. And on the medical side, especially, it's so exciting as we see more technologies that enable people to actually um, get vital medical service within their own homes. I'm sure some of you, like me, have taken advantage of maybe having a telemedicine appointment with your doctor. Um, there's a new technology that can also take your readings from home and send them directly to your doctor to help inform them before you come to your next visit. We're also supporting a number of uh, traveling nurse associations that are able to get out to rural communities. And it's a real um, priority for us at USDA Rural Development. Uh, Michaela earlier mentioned our community facilities programs. And one of the major things that they find in hospitals, and I'm sure you like me know that rural hospitals are closing at a very rapid pace. And that's a huge um, challenge for our rural communities and how to overcome that lack of healthcare. Uh, we're hopeful, we don't think that our distance learning and telemedicine program makes up for having a rural hospital and local doctors, but we're hopeful that it can provide a connection to these rural communities to the healthcare that we all know we need every day. So we continue to support that program. Uh, we. Congress has continued to increase the amount of funds we've received for that program, and we're excited. Uh, we're right in the middle of reviewing the applications we received this year, and hopefully we'll be able to make about $120 million investment in those projects this year. So uh, we'll see over time uh, as we get through those applications, but we're really excited about what those projects can do. Um, and then finally, I wanted to touch on a brand new initiative we have, but I think it also kind of uh, touches on a point I've heard a couple times this afternoon, and that's our new broadband technical assistance program. We have been operating these broadband and telecommunications programs for decades, and we, for a lot of these um, 
technical assistance have really leveraged our own staff and especially those general field representatives we have in the field, working with communities, um, communicating about opportunities we have. But we have heard a consistent theme from rural communities across the nation, which is we need more support. It's not enough to have someone explaining to us that we have a funding opportunity. We need a partner that can really walk us through the process. And so we're really hoping that this new technical assistance program can be that partner for so many of our rural communities. Uh, we have a current funding window that's open right now where we have $20 million available for grant funds. Um, and there's kind of two different paths that we're accepting applications through that program. One of those paths is for technical assistance providers and for uh, folks that provide that technical assistance to come into us, identify a region or a group that they can really support. And uh, we're actually already actively working with a couple different states to look at potential technical assistance providers to serve them. Additionally, we are also looking at a separate path, which is for communities that can come directly to us through that program to seek funding to support their needs to develop a plan to deploy broadband in their community. And again, through that program, we have $20 million available. Uh, we are limiting projects to no more than $1 million per project, but I am anticipating we will have a lot of projects below that level. Uh, depending on what we learn through this first um, funding window, we are anticipating another funding opportunity next year for this program. So for folks that aren't yet in a position to apply for this technical assistance funds, don't worry, we, we plan on being here next year. We'll have another funding window that we will be opening up. But again, we're hopeful that this can be a program that can provide opportunities for rural communities that don't really know where to get started. You know, it's it's great if you have a local telephone or electric company in your area that wants to build out broadband to you. But if you don't, it's often difficult for our rural communities to know what resource to, to seek out. So we're hoping that this can provide an opportunity. And I just want to highlight that in that program, it will not only support potential projects for funding at USDA, but projects across all of these different federal programs that we've talked about this afternoon. So communities that want to go after BEAD funding or FCC funding, we're hopeful that these technical assistance resources can be there to support all of those different funding and needs that we have. So I just want to end by saying thank you guys again so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure to be here this afternoon and hear from so many different folks. As we uh, move forward into the next year, we know there's going to be a lot of work on just not just administering our program, but also engaging with the Hill on Farm Bill, which will be very implemented, um, which will have a major impact on our program. With that, happy to take questions if we have them. Just stay there. We'll pick questions yeah. to you. Um, early on, we were talking about a speed of 25.3 um, in, in expanding rural broadband. Uh, that got picked up uh, pretty quickly in the conversation and in the funding demand. What is the speed that uh, your projects are being deployed at? Absolutely. So for us in our fourth round of funding for Reconnect, we're requiring all projects to deliver 100 symmetrical service. Now we know for a lot of folks, they don't need 100 symmetrical service today, but what we see is a continued increase in demand for what consumers and businesses need at home. And from our perspective, we're making 20 to 30 year commitments to these communities. So we are requiring all of our projects to be able to deliver that level of service. They, every community or every consumer doesn't have to um, subscribe to that level of service, but any entities who receive funding for us have to ensure that their projects can deliver that level of service. That's fast. That is fast. That's fast for rural America. Um, what about the coordination between all the different funding, the NTIA, FCC, USDA, um, the various levels of funding? But uh, what what? Kind of coordination is, uh, can, can we look at between all those uh, NPIs funding projects here and this here? There are communications over there, uh, and, and, and maybe two or three in, in this area. So, how how is how the coordinating uh, of all those projects going to work out? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I think that coordination started with communicating with each other about what it is we're doing. 
and making sure that agencies are aware of upcoming funding opportunities and policies that we have. Um, but we've expanded it past that. Um, last year, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with all of our federal partners, FCC, Department of Commerce, and Department of Treasury, which we haven't talked about a lot, but they do have funding for broadband expansion as well. And so we have a memorandum of understanding now that enables us as agencies to share really granular data with each other. And so we, we share that information with each other so that we can inform each other about where our investments have been. And in fact, this morning, I was just corresponding with uh, my partners at FCC and Department of Commerce. Uh, we all are statutorily required to work together to develop a map that will be available to uh, the public on where our investments have gone to so that it can be more transparent to the public. You know, I think each of our agencies historically have had kind of our own websites and our own way of sharing where our investments have been. And this will be a new map um, that will hopefully complement the fabric that FCC has already issued on the availability of broadband. Um, but this will be more focused on where our investments have been so that we can ensure that we want to make sure we're complementing and not duplicating the work of each other. So we've got a couple here from the Zoom, people online asking questions. Uh, is there any discussion at USDA to use rural development funds to set up telemedicine facilities in rural areas where healthcare is limited? No, there hasn't. But I, I think that's a really great suggestion. You know, and one thing that we're really challenging ourselves on with our distance learning and telemedicine program is with the state of rural hospitals, with the new and emerging technologies we have, what changes that we need to make to the program. Um, I can tell you today that wouldn't be an eligible purpose under our program, but I think that's a really great suggestion and one that I'm happy to take back to our leadership, as well as to Nikhila and folks on the Hill as we start to look at the next farm bill and how that impacts our program. So thank you for that. That's a great suggestion. Uh, credit to Phil, Phil Prelly from Connecticut, Lockdown Granger. Um, another question, uh, folks out in Illinois is, uh, do your programs consider satellite technologies uh, such as Starlink to be viable solutions or options for broadband? Great question. You know, satellite is a really interesting technology and one that I think has a lot of opportunities. Um, at the same time, when we went out and did our public notice, it's the number one comment that we got was, I have access to satellite service, but I can't do this and I can't do that. And it's not a um, substitute for other types of service. So uh, we don't at this point uh, find me on satellite service. It doesn't mean that it won't be an eligible technology at some point, but I think based on what we've seen today, it just has limitations that don't meet the speed uh, requirements we have, as well as the um, over subscription and, and different things that we're looking at to make sure that folks not only have access at some points during the day, but all points during the day to high quality broadband service. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's one that was asked to the last speaker, but I think maybe you can probably speak to too from uh, Leroy Watson. Uh, he asked about municipal broadband services. He says, I'm a resident of one of the five New Hampshire towns consolidated communications required by fiber optic. The town borrowed $2 million at 2% to fund our portion of the deployment. This equals $7.50 per month per customer. Today, municipal interest rates will increase customer monthly costs to $15 to $20 a month. Are there low cost loan programs that rural towns can tap to fund fiber deployment programs like consolidated to keep costs affordable to end user customers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be honest with you, most people and most entities coming to us are looking for grant funding, uh, but we have a lot of loan funding available and that's definitely something that we would love to be a part of. We worked with a number of uh, municipalities to provide that low cost loan funding. And actually, it's an area that we're very undersubscribed. Most of our programs, we get a lot more applications than we have funding to support, but we actually have quite a bit of available loan funding. So definitely reach out to me. We'd love to, to work with that, that community to provide those funds. Well, Leroy, if you heard that, uh, I know you're out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your talent. Uh, undersubscribed is good for you to hear, I guess. <laughs> um, see, another one we had for our last speaker, uh, but didn't quite get to, but relevant to you as well, uh, is from Kevin Coastley from Nebraska. He asked about um, his specific service provider said uh, Verizon has been awful. 
uh, when it comes to both broadband and cell service in rural Nebraska. Uh, is there any way to put pressure on them to step up? I think he's you know, talking about making sure that you know folks are accountable uh, and service providers are accountable to the commitments they make in communities and to the government and to folks uh, in rural America. So. Yeah, question. absolutely. So, you know, I think, unfortunately, we all have that experience having a provider in our community that isn't delivering on the service that we expect. Um, I've lived in downtown D.C., I've lived in Bethesda, Maryland, I've, I've lived in Kansas, and in each of those places, I had service providers that I was so frustrated, you know, I'm searching online for an alternative. And lucky for me, I live in a place that has alternatives. And I think that's a great point that as we're moving forward, one of the major things that I think all of the agencies are looking at and when we really take the heart at USDA is making sure that we're not just providing the funding, but the commitment is followed through on. And I think one thing that's kind of interesting in terms of incentivizing those providers is that I think the, the federal funds themselves and the potential that new competition could be coming in in a lot of communities, we're seeing these really major service providers proactively building out because they're so worried about competition. And I always tell people, if all I have to do is, is tell someone I might fund a project in an area and a large provider comes in and serves them, I mean, what a benefit that is to all of us. But I, I do think that for a lot of these major providers, we've seen quite a bit of build out over the last year or two. And I think also with the federal funds that are being committed, all of them are, are um, contingent on some pretty significant reporting standards so that we can make sure that those providers actually follow through on the things they make. All right. Uh, and maybe one last one since we're running up on four o'clock here. I'll let you get out of here. Um, this is from Richard Wise, long time member. Uh, is rural America competing with underserved urban areas for these funds? So, how is that? Sort of dynamic competition work. Well, that's a great question. So for us at USDA, all of our funding has to go to rural communities. So um, you know we're statutorily prohibited from funding urban and suburban communities, and so that means that our rural communities are competing with other um, urban and suburban communities. They're only competing with other rural communities. Um, but on a larger federal perspective, I think what you'll see is that the funds are. Um, intended to go to unserved first, underserved next. So I still think that uh, with that in mind, the focus will be on those rural communities that are completely unserved. Well, thank you, Alan. Well, thank you, appreciate it. Lauren, after all these years, it's finally good to get some answers uh, to broadband in rural America, by golly. Uh, and I know that uh, the Rural Utility Service uh, has, had to make a leap of uh, both management and technology and management in the last 10 years because where we were 10, 15 years ago in rural America and the Rural Utility Service, where we are today, uh, has been a dramatic shift. And congratulations. Uh, this has been very heartwarming and uh, very, very uh, informative. Thank you. One last little briefing. Um, we're going to have uh, Misty Burns, I believe, you're on, and we want to you tell us about the uh, new broadband initiative that the National Grange is undertaking. Yeah, thanks, Burton, and uh, hello, Grangers. Hello, I'm Misty Burris. I am a Granger uh, out of Oregon, and if you remember, if you were there, we uh, brought our team in for the fly-in last year. Uh, we are first and foremost a grant writing team. And uh, like we've heard today, there's lots of many projects being rolled out from the administration and, and a great deal of them, if not all of them, uh, need navigators to help walk everybody through. And that's essentially what uh, I did as I took my grant writing team and trans trans transferred them and placed them into roles to be navigators to bring these agendas. And Affordable connectivity program was uh, one of our big agendas. And when Amanda and uh, the, the National Grange approached us and said, wow, we we really fit this agenda. And and it was true. We really went and wrote a presentation in response to this grant request for the affordable connectivity program for the deep based on the deep roots of connectivity that the Grange has and, 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 and is in action with and everything they do. 
And we saw this and, and um, uh, partnership, this opportunity to deliver those uh, necessary resources on the ground to the public to, to bring the message that there is this uh, program to bring affordable connectivity to their homes, to their regions, to their communities, and essentially to the, to the Granges that are the connection points. And so we did get uh, in a partnership with Oregon Institute for a Better Way, National Grange and Community System Navigators, we did receive a letter that we are recipients for the affordable connectivity program and that Roots of, Connecti uh, Roots of Connectivity will launch. And so you will find us on Monday. Uh, you'll see a launch of the ACPRC.org, which is the Affordable Connectivity Program, rootsofconnectivity.org website that will be the presentation of our partnership. And you'll see us lay out an incredible incentive program and a, a cooperative agreement where navigators are going to meet Grangers in their states, in their communities, in their halls, in their, in their networks to see how we can utilize this incredible uh, agenda of connecting the, the United States. And you, the cool thing we heard today was the multiple networks that are being remapped. And that's what the what we see this bigger perspective of the, the affordable connectivity program partnership with the Grange is showing the nation that there are these deep roots of connectivity through the Grange, deep rooted in agriculture and in partnership, long term agreements and partnerships with the USDA and with the FCC and our interest to bring uh, access around. So I believe that this is going to be an exciting two years. And this is the first opportunity for us as a partnership with the Grange to step into the world of, of government action and funded uh, programs that will build the Grange and, and build our membership and build our, our, our position in the United States that we have had the whole time in action and connection. So I'm glad. Thank you for giving us a moment today where your team is here and we'll be coming to see you soon. Well, thank you, Misty, for presenting and thank you for getting the grant for the, for the grade. This is exciting. It's a, it's a toe in the water and uh, we'll, uh, we appreciate your efforts and with your enthusiasm and vibrance, I'm sure it'll go well. We want to thank all of our speakers today and all of those of you out there watching uh, it's been a very beautiful afternoon, and uh, we've learned uh, a whole lot. And um, if you haven't uh, seen it already on the Grange website and on the Grange Month celebration, I guess uh, Sean and I got roped into appearing tomorrow night at 8 o'clock to follow up on some of these issues. So we'll have a, a little dog and pony show. He's a pony and I'm the dog uh, tomorrow night. And we'll follow up on a whole lot of these issues at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. 8.30? At 8.30, okay. Uh, tomorrow night if you want to follow up on some of this. Thank you very much. And uh, from Washington, we are in the Green uh, Conference Room and right near the White House. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'd love to have you come see us and we'll follow up on some of these in person. Thank you. Mm -hmm.